Good evening, folks, and welcome to the July 23rd, 2019 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals. We have just a couple of items on the agenda this evening. Um, we first will, well, before we move to approving the minutes for from the June meeting, I want to recognize uh, Joseph, Joseph Barbieri, who's joining us in his first meeting. Thank you for coming here to, uh, to assist. Glad to be here. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Hopefully it will not be a baptism by fire. <laughs> Bring it on. Uh, next up, approval of the minutes from the June 25th, 2019 meeting. Uh, the uh, minutes have been circulated to all of the board members. And I would seek a motion to approve those minutes, um, assuming that there aren't any amendments. Just, just a quick point of order. I wasn't here for that meeting, so I would abstain from that. And I believe Joseph was not here too. So can you get approval with three members? I too were not, I was not at that meeting. All right, so we will <laughs> defer. Maybe just, we can postpone that. We'll defer approval of the June 25th meeting minutes, uh, which only serves to expedite our agenda here this evening. Uh, there is uh, no uh, old business, so we will move on to new business. And agenda item one for new business is to hear the request of uh, Liz Delacaris, the owner of the property at 5 Hillcast Drive, Matthew 10, Lot 8, to build a screen porch on an existing deck and that's her application is based on section 19-4-3.b.4 of the zoning ordinance. And uh, I'd ask our code enforcement officer to give us a uh, synopsis of the application. Sure, uh, a couple months ago, Ms. Delacaris's builder uh, submitted a building permit to turn an existing 12, 12 by 12 deck into a screen porch, put a, a roof and walls on it. And she lives at Five Hillcrest Drive. It's a non-conforming lot with a non-conforming structure on it. The side of the house is currently six feet from the side property line. And the existing 12 by 12 deck is 18 feet from that same side property line. The the setback for an open deck in that zone is 15 feet, so the deck as it sits meets that setback, but in order to enclose a deck, the setback goes from 15 to 25. So I was able to permit that open deck three years ago uh, without your assistance, but now that it's going to have a roof, it needs zoning board approval for expansion of a non-conforming structure. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Delacaris, we'll turn this over to you. You may step to the podium and... So, am I supposed to just say what I have to say? Well, we, we would just ask you to uh, perhaps offer a, a synopsis of your application oh, okay. and then answer any questions that we may have. Um, building permit, um, it was stated no railings will be a screen porch in the spring, so I, we didn't really think there was any problem with it, so, but we did apply for the other permit with some drawings, and then Ben said that that wasn't correct, so we submitted other drawings, which, and I think you have them, that's what my contractor said, he submitted a whole other set to you, and um, I guess the notices have been sent to my abutters, although only one of them I think is relevant and they don't have any issues, so I just want to build a screen porch. And I have the, those papers if you don't have them there with you, Ben. Contractor said that he's sent them yeah, all to you. Do you have them? Everybody up here has a copy of your application. Yep. We've got the entirety of the application, I believe. Okay, yeah, thank you. And as I understand it, the footprint for the air, for, for this area remains the same. There will be no expansion of that deck to accommodate this porch. No, no, that's it. Yeah. Is this intended as a as a as a three season? I don't know that it necessarily matters. I'm just summer curious. Thing. Just a summer thing. Just okay. Keep the mosquitoes away. And enjoy me. <laughs> sure. Uh, 
and I'd inv invite the uh, members of the board to ask any questions of the applicant. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I have any, I have one question that's probably more directed um, to Ben, but if this were, if there were no deck here today and Ms. Delacaris wanted to build the screened-in porch, we would still be reviewing this under 1943B4, correct? Yes. Yep. Okay. Identical process. Okay. And, yep. and just out of intellectual curiosity, what, what is, it, is it in the code that triggers the difference between the flat deck and the fact that it's enclosed? Uh, an open an open deck less than 10 feet above grade has a separate setback requirement in the zoning ordinance of 15 feet rather than 25 or 30. Okay, so that's where the enclosure comes in. Okay. And by open deck, that means it can't have a railing either? No, or? it could have a railing. Okay. It's the, the, the zoning ordinance defines deck and porch distinctively different. Okay. So it's really the roof okay. that, that causes it. Okay. I want to, I have two questions. Um, one point of order there. Yes. Um, when you were talking about um, if this application was fresh and new mm -hmm. and there was no deck, mm -hmm. where would you put the deck in the three season room? So my query is if there was nothing, no object there today, there is space in the building envelope where this would not encroach a setback. That's theoretically possible. There are, uh, Ms. Delacaris may want to speak to, you know, other windows and doors that preclude that. As an, op as an option. As an option. And What's the question? Uh, we were just addressing the point there, but yep. um, if there was no deck today, yes. where would you put this three season room to keep the mosquitoes out? Where else would I put it? Yes. Probably nowhere because I think the septic tank is down on the other side. Plus, it's off my kitchen, which is where I want it to be, so I can come and go through that door. Sure. Can you do you recall the year upon which you obtained the building permit for the deck? Yeah. Yeah, I have it right here. It's 2016. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Any additional questions uh, at this time for the applicant? All right, Ms. Delacaris, you are welcome to stand down. We'll, we would reserve the right to ask you additional questions, course, in which case we, we would call you back to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Ben, did we receive any, uh, did the town, did you receive any uh, email comments on this? We didn't receive any comments, no correspondence. Okay. Would then open the floor to members of the public to comment on this particular application. Hearing none, we will close this particular application to public comment and move forward with board discussion. I really only have one concern, and it's not a concern about this application in particular. It's more of a sort of broader public policy. I don't actually have any issues with this application. I don't think it increases the nonconformity. I, I believe all of our other things have been met. I would just be concerned in the case where um, there is an increase in nonconformity if somebody builds a deck, but then it closes it later. And you know, essentially, it's a, like a little backdoor loophole into building something. And I don't, again, I don't think that's happening here. I'm fully supportive of this application, but that was one thing. I don't know, uh, Matt, if you were kind of touching on that a little bit, but I, that sort of popped into my mind. Um, again, something to be mindful of in the future. I think that that would only be true if, if the deck was the closest. If the deck Correct. became the closest thing to the property line. Correct, and it's not here, so it doesn't. And, to me, it doesn't increase the nonconformity. And I think w what you're describing would be would be considered a variance. Correct. It wouldn't come. It wouldn't under come this. under this. Because it would then be an increase in. An it, that would be an increase of nonconformity. Yeah. Yep. So I don't have any issues with this application, but. And in fact, that, that would be one of our findings per the ordinance um, 
would be that the proposed structure won't increase the nonconformity of the existing structure. Uh, of course, we always we're always required to consider the size of the lot, the slope of the land, potential for soil erosion, location of other structures, uh, impact on views. Um, there are a couple of other factors, but none of those seem to be triggered by by simply uh, screening in and closing um, an open deck, and, and, and that that is in my opinion. Uh, but I'd invite other thoughts from. From members of the board. I have, I have no concerns. Yeah. And just briefly, I don't think that the, there's evidence before us to suggest that there's a non-conformance creep, if you will. Um, uh, um, the issue for me is that there is space to have a deck or a you know, three-season room, but. Uh, given the time distance between the first building permit and today, I, I think um, it's most efficient to use the space for the current deck uh, for this application and build it where it is. Um, I would make a motion then that we approve uh, the request of Liz Delacaris, owner of the property at Five Hill Crest Drive. Map U10, Lot A, to expand a non-conforming single-family dwelling by adding a screen porch over an existing deck based on Section 1943B.4 of the Zoning Ordinance. Thank you. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you. Uh, the motion is seconded. Uh, discussion on the motion. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? is unanimous, the motion carries. Move on to uh, findings of fact. Proposed finding of fact one, the property is a non-conforming lot in the RA zone. There is an existing non-conforming single family dwelling on the property. Addition, uh, proposed additional finding of fact one, the Zoning Board of Appeals has considered the size of the lot, the slope of the land, the potential for soil erosion, the location of other structures on the property and on adjacent properties, the impact on views and the type and amount of vegetation to be removed to accomplish the relocation. Proposed additional finding of fact two, the proposed structure will not increase the nonconformity of the existing structure. Proposed additional finding of fact three, the proposed structure is in compliance with the setback requirement to the greatest practical extent. Proposed conclusion, proposed enlargement meets the setback to the greatest practical extent based on the physical condition and type of foundation present in addition to the criteria in section 1943B2 relocation. Chair, I have a request, uh, a proposed finding on number four. We draft a similar statement from the other applicants uh, form uh, from number six and use something similar to that language. So I would say that uh, the, uh, the proposed, uh, proposed additional finding of fact four, the applicant has demonstrated compliance with section 19-43B4 of the zoning ordinance. That's correct. I would entertain a motion to approve the proposed findings of fact. Um, real quickly before that, is the conclusion new? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just didn't remember that from previous. Uh, <laughs> and it's it's somewhat redundant. You can. Okay. No, I'm good with it. I just I, I don't remember seeing it before. And, uh, yeah, I, I uh, so moved to approve uh, the findings of fact. We have a second. I'll second. Thank you. Discussion on the motion to approve the proposed findings of fact. Hearing no discussion. All in favor? Unanimous. 
Motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Delacaris. I hope you enjoy your new screened in deck. The <laughs> mosquitoes are particularly vicious right now. <laughs> Next item of new business, uh, to hear the request of Mary June Casey, co-owner of the property at 9 Channel View Road, map U38, lot 10, for a conditional use permit for a home daycare based on sections 19-8-8 and 19-5-5 of the zoning ordinance. I would ask our code enforcement officer, Mr. Uh, ben McDougall, to comment on uh, the issue, the application. Sure. It, uh, it came to my attention a couple months ago that uh, a daycare was being operated at 9 Channel View Road. Uh, I then drove to the property. I spoke with Mr. Preble, uh, explained the zoning to him, met with him. He submitted an application based on Section 1988 of the zoning ordinance. It's, a, it's an interesting process. This is the first time this has come in front of the zoning boards in the six and a half years that I've been here. Uh, the way it works is I get a conditional use application from the applicant and I notice a butters. And then if a butters express concerns about the conditional use standards, I have the option to bring it in front of the zoning board. If I don't feel that concerns based on conditional use have been, uh, if I don't feel there's legitimate concerns expressed by the neighbors, then I can approve the application. I did get feedback from three neighbors that had concerns about the conditional use requirements, so I felt it was the right thing to bring it in front of this board. So here we are. Initial questions from board members for Mr. McDougall before we move on to the presentation? Of course, we can cover that later as well, but I don't know if there's anything preliminarily. Um, yes, is there anything in, in state law that addresses whether local governments should or should not approve uh, home daycare? I, I don't know that there is. I've, I've been speaking regularly uh, with a woman from the state daycare licensing, mm -hmm. and uh, she hasn't expressed that opinion to me one way or the other. Okay, because yeah, I just understood that some states kind of weigh in on the propriety of home daycare. I, th I don't know if Maine had It's my impression that the state respects local zoning and the, and the local process. I've, I've had no impression otherwise and I've dealt with them several times. I'm, I'm sure we'll come back to you, Ben, as this yeah. moves forward. Okay. <laughs> for sure, for sure. All right, then we'll move on. I'll allow the applicant an opportunity to, uh, to comment on this. So what I'd like to do is um, introduce uh, Mary Casey uh, to the board. Um, Mary has been resident at Nine Channel View Road for quite a number of years. Um, um, her um, husband, Jeff Preble, is here. Um, Jeff and Mary have been quite engaged in a process um, that has uh, focused on both uh, state uh, daycare licensing. Um, I've had contact with Kathy. Um, who was um, with um, uh, the Head Start program in South Portland before she started daycare licensing about six and a half years ago. Um, and so um, I heard from both Ben and Kathy that they had not heard a word about this particular daycare facility. Um, but once the complaint came forward, it is my understanding in many proceedings that both the state and local unit of government get involved. And so we come forward uh, with some um, feeling that we have been treated very well by both the state licensing officer and very fairly by the local code enforcement officer and that we are subject to the sound jurisdiction of this board. And so we have to satisfy you on what's called a conditional use review. 
So I'd like to make sure that we give you just a summary uh, set of PowerPoint slides that'll just walk you through our presentation. Um, they are summary as to what's already been submitted. We're not gonna burden you with a lot of new information. Um, there are also a number of supporters present here this evening, just to get a rough sense of who in the room is here in support of the application. If you could raise your hand if you're in support of the application, I think it might be helpful to the board to have an impression of the support that this applicant engenders. And it's not because of who she is, it's because of what she does. Uh, and I think it's very compatible both with your comprehensive plan and with the neighborhood and with the whole nature of the wonder of Cape Elizabeth, which is a very great residential community. And so I think this is wholly consistent and we'll bring forward data points to try to address that. The application came into you in two stages. The application came first and then we submitted a supplement so that we addressed uh, the details of the questions that you should have under your standards. And so um, I would just thank Jeff again for both stages of that application process, but fundamentally I'd like to thank Mary uh, for what she does. So I'm gonna defer to Mary because she has the front end of, of the uh, PowerPoint slides. A colleague of mine, um, Sam, is going to present to each of you uh, the PowerPoint slides. There are copies for members of the public if members of the public would like a copy of those, if you just raise your hand, if you'd like a copy of those, and we'll make sure they come to you. The other thing that will come to you, um, not from the applicant, but from uh, the supporters, is uh, a copy of the 27 emails in support of this application, just so you have it for your records and your file. And again, I don't want to burden either the secretary of this board or the board members. They're really summary as to what you've seen previously, but there's some good detail uh, as to both the standards and the support of the use. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Mary Casey to introduce you as to what Primary Focus does and what she does as part of Primary Focus. Mary. Hi. Hello, Ms. Casey. Hi. I am the teacher at uh, Primary Focus. I'm usually used to talking to children, so this is uh, a little nerve-wracking for me. So um, I wrote a cheat sheet here, so I'll try to be quick and, and on the point <coughs> with what I've written. I'll give you a quick background of the school so you will have a better understanding as to why I started the school and why I want it to stay as a small school in my home. The school started as a playgroup for my daughter and two of her friends. The idea was that they would play and learn primary skills in a fun way to help them prepare for kindergarten. Before I had my own children, I was a public elementary school teacher for 10 years in Los Angeles. I loved this job and missed it, so I found that this play group gave me some intrinsic rewards that teaching provided me back in Los Angeles. So this play group eventually evolved into a little home school that I adore with pretty much the same mission, to provide a small group of children who are about to enter kindergarten a fun and nurturing place with an academic program focused on reading, printing, and math. So when they enter kindergarten and beyond, they are confident, happy, experienced, and successful students. If you turn to page two, you will see that over the years, I have developed a well-defined well-defined goals in the area of reading and math. My reading goals are that the children learn the 42 sounds of the English language, how to print in lowercase the entire alphabet, and eventually read, spell, and print words that have three or more letters in them. My math goals are that the children will learn to recognize and form the numbers at least up to 20, become very confident with the number line up to 100 by learning to count by tens, fives, odds, and evens, introduce place value, and then learn to add and subtract. I try very hard to get each student to master as many of these goals as possible. Each child is different, so every student masters them at their own pace using different teaching strategies. This is why I love teaching to very small groups of children. These academic goals are given to the parents in the beginning of the year, so we are able to work together as a team and have the same thought in mind. 
on page three, I would like to discuss the long-term benefits of a preschool like mine, serving children one to two years before kindergarten with a strong academic program linked with a fun, nurturing, and positive atmosphere. On the bottom of page three, I have added highlights of three separate educational papers. The first paper finds that children who attend pre-kindergarten, like my, my program, can triple the fraction of, of students that read at grade level or above. The second paper states that pre-K programs like mine improves readiness for school and raises performance and academic achievement tests. The third paper concludes that students who attend pre-K programs are more likely to graduate from high school, attend, and complete college. On page four, I hope this helps to demonstrate why I'm only interested in teaching up to six students at the school at one time. I design my own worksheets, games, stories, and songs that are fun and individually targeted to help each student learn the important reading and math concepts at their own pace. These are a few examples of what we learn to sing to, dance to, sound out, chant, read, and eventually bring home to practice what each student has learned and mastered. Page five will take you inside of my home through these photos. And hopefully you'll see how special and unique Oh, boy. Ms. Casey, take your time. Take your time. How special and unique it is to be able to have a school in a home. My home school has five different rooms to play and learn in. They are upstairs and downstairs, so we are never stuck in one fluorescent room all day long. We go from one room to the next, and each room has a different feel and a different, with different toys and different objective. There's a brain room where we learn to print really big on really big whiteboards. There is a big playroom where we play really big with a rock wall and a play kitchen area and a sensory center and a train set and um, a lot of forts and things like that. There is a quiet playroom that holds books, puzzles, board games, paper, and crayons. There is the music room where we play indoor games, dance, and sing. There is a kitchen where we have lunch together, we bake, we perform science experiences, and we make art together. And just outside the door, there is the natural beauty of the beach and the Greenbelt Trails. I think it is good that children are able to, to spend their days in a home rather than in a facility. On page six, describes the operation of the school and why it is run more like a small home school than a daycare. I follow the Pond Cove Elementary School calendar. Same holidays, vacation days, snow days, February break, April break. The maximum number of students at any one time is six. I've operated many days with as few as one student. In October of 2018, for example, the average was 3.8 students per day open. I have operated as few as two days per week and as many as five days per week. It just kind of depends on what the students want for that year. Start and end times have been generally the same as Pond Cove Elementary School. I start a little bit later than Pond Cove at 8.30, and I end a little bit earlier than Pond Cove, which is at 3 o'clock p.m. Some students stay for a full day, while others stay for just a half a day. The past two years, I am now uh, I'm, I'm carpooling the children home because it's just easier 
uh, and if we're interested in something, we can just keep going and then leave. And also, um, also it's, it's just a nice way to end, end the day. I love this school. I love what I do. I love that it is in my home. And I love that it is in a beautiful, natural setting for the children. I hope that I have helped you understand a little bit. And, um, okay, I hope that you understand a little bit more about this school and what, and I hope it can remain in my home. Thank you. Thank you. So again, Andrew Hamilton of Eaton Peabody. Um, I'd like to say I could match the substance or the passion that you've just heard, but I don't think it's possible. Um, I'll do my best. Um, so um, turning to page seven, um, I'd just like to sort to to cite the, the organic document for the town of Cape Elizabeth, and that's your comprehensive plan. If you would go not to page 42, to page 43, I will read to you a couple of very brief quotes. Because um, I think it really shows the care that this community has taken to think about commercial activities in residential areas. And I can't think of Mary's use as a commercial activity because it's a four bedroom house to begin with. The septic was sized to a four bedroom home. Um, you've heard the number of students that are four to five years of age that occupy during pretty limited daytime hours. And when I think of the scope and limits of the use, um, this is what conditional use review was designed to do. As the law court has said, you got three use categories in most municipalities. Permitted uses, permitted by right. As Ben would say, don't have to even come to this board or to the planning board, you're permitted. Middle category, conditional use review. Third category, prohibited use. We're not a prohibited use. We're not a permitted by right use. We're a conditional use review. And we submit to the jurisdiction of this board. It's your judgment based upon standards that, from my perspective, for this use, given all of the land use and environmental projects I've worked on over 35 years, this has to be one of the easier ones in terms of the enormity of the envelope that the community is trying to make sure a commercial activity does not exceed in the residential zone. Such things as unreasonable or excessive traffic, excessive noise, noise from four to five year old kids. I, I, I've been in neighborhoods, both living and working, where you'll hear hot ride cars going up and down the street. I've been in neighborhoods where you hear parties that happen. Um, I've been out of my camp, which I was darn sure to be on Saturday, given the heat wave, where I heard music, I heard voters with radios or boxes. I know what noise is. I've had to calibrate it in the context of everything from wind energy turbines to refrigeration units, so-called reefer units on the water. This case does not test my understanding of what would be as compared to the conditional use standards. So I'm just going to quote from the comp plan because the comp plan gives an idea of what's appropriate. It says at the middle of page 43, a variety of home businesses also operate in residential areas. There's a small increase in the number of residents who work from home. Almost all private childcare facilities are located in residential districts. The first choice for locating commercial activity should be a business district. So if this was truly a commercial scale operation, put it in the business district. But as the comp plan goes on to say, however, the town will continue to allow low impact commercial activities that do not substantially decrease the peaceful, quiet, and enjoyment of residential neighborhoods. The community in language that is not enforceable, because the comp plan just provides the goals or objectives, it's the zoning ordinance that provides the regulatory teeth. The comp plan is saying, we know we've got 
daycare activity. I would submit to you that I have the joy of just becoming a grandfather. January 2, remember it was like it was yesterday. Grandson, it's been a while since my daughter was of a daycare age, but I know a lot of people in my firm, in my community, in my neighborhood that have young children. You know what's one of the harder things to do right now? Is find suitable, competent daycare. This isn't just daycare. You saw the educational objectives. You, you've seen what this school is able to do. You'll hear more about it later, so I'm not gonna belabor it. So small daycare preparing children age four to five for kindergarten is compatible, I think, with a residential aid district. So conditional use is a use that's not clearly prohibited. Um, page eight, a conditional use under a zoning ordinance results from a legislative determination. Cape Elizabeth has determined that such a use will not ordinarily be detrimental or injurious to the neighborhood within that zone. And that's the law court's decision back in 83 in Cope versus inhabitants of the town of Brunswick. Daycares are necessary in Cape Elizabeth and the town's comprehensive plan notes that they are located in residential zones. There's the permission from the legislative body of this town saying it's okay to have daycares in residential zones. But moving on, the conditional use must establish two things to be permitted. The use must be consistent with the town standards and those standards are articulated in the standards that you'll apply this evening. Um, I can already tell that this board knows how to competently apply standards. The second requirement is under certain conditions, the use is consistent with other uses in the zones. Not always, but under certain conditions. This is that case and we'll be presenting conditions of approval in just a moment that will suggest under certain conditions, this conditional use can be approved. In order to support the workforce, there must be a place for children to go while their parents work. Ms. Casey's daycare keeps children close to home while preparing them for their first year of school. The daycare is compatible with the neighborhood because of its size, the age of its pupils, and its learning objectives. A small group of no more than six children aged four to five years old preparing for kindergarten within a home setting is what we have here. As you heard Mary say, it started with a, a play group. It then grew slightly into a group that, as she said, averages somewhere between 3.8 and five students if you want to average the, the, the student participation over the course of a month. Not a heavy use at that location. Um, this uniquely designed small schooling program is not detrimental or injurious to the neighborhood. In my judgment, this ultimately will be your judgment. It's not anybody that will speak to you tonight. It's your judgment that counts on that question. Um, but I think it's designed and operated to be compatible uh, with a comprehensive plan goal of having suitable daycares in the Residence A Zoning District. More fundamentally, Ms. Casey's school does um, more than a daycare. It transitions four to five-year-olds for success in kindergarten and beyond the town school. Be because this nation believes in preparing kids for school, you have programs like the Head Start program. This private home care schooling provides very attentive, a very appropriate um, teacher to pupil ratio that makes sure that these kids get what they need to be ready and to be learning when they come to the public school or any other school that the family decides they should attend. Uh, the daycare complies with the town standards and is consistent with the residential neighborhood. The standards for this conditional use, as we understand, pages 65 to 66 of the zoning ordinance found at section 1955, uh, provide essentially five standards which we'll now address. A home daycare is a conditional use, and we believe that you'll agree, once all the evidence is before you tonight, that this particular use is consistent with the standards and conforms with the standards. The first standard is the proposed use will not create hazardous traffic conditions um, when added to existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. Uh, Martha and Jeff, uh, the, the state licensing staffer that you've been talking to is Kathy Paglio. When I spoke with Kathy, I said, um, can you give me some understanding that I could take to the board as to whether this is an exceptional uh, use or whether it's within 
uh, the type of uses. She said, first of all, I've been doing this for six and a half years. Um, I worked in South Portland. I know Cape Elizabeth. The very first time I had a complaint was just a couple months ago. I'm required by law to report that complaint on to the local code officer. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm required to go and visit the site. She said, when I visited the site, Andy, one of the reasons why I think Cape Elizabeth is a bit more progressive than the state in terms of the licensing rules is there's no minimum area per student for the play area, the out outdoor play area. There's also no fencing requirement, except we like to see in busy areas that there be a fenced area. She said, I've been to the home of Jeff and Mary, and I don't find this at all to be a busy area. One of the reasons it's not over congested is because of the capacity of the roadway system. Anybody that's traveled on that roadway knows that there's one of the larger traffic circles and there's plenty of opportunity for vehicles to come in, approach the use on the right, turn right into the driveway, and then travel out the traffic circle and come back out. Uh, the second thing that I think is notable is that the school program is small and we've proposed as a condition that we'll talk about in just a moment that um, traffic flow will be managed through staggered start times. There'll be two sessions. There need not be much more than 15 minutes between the start of the first session and the start of the second. But we can manage the sessions so there's no more than three drop-offs or three pickups for any single session. Anybody that's seen uh, an aerial photo of the driveway of Jeff and Mary will know there's ample room for three vehicles in addition to um, the uh, vehicles of, of the occupants, uh, Jeff and, and, and Mary's. I was there tonight. We had five vehicles. We managed to fit within the driveway. I wouldn't want to try to do that regularly, but it's easy to do it with four. Um, no on-street parking will be allowed. We'll agree to a condition that dictates that there be no on-street parking. And finally, I think the turnaround circle does provide ample capacity for traffic flows. Traffic circulation for this site is just not an issue, given the, the, the scale of the use and really the good infrastructure that exists in terms of that street and, and traffic circle. The next one is that the proposed use will not create unsanitary conditions by reason of sanitary disposal, emission to the air, or other aspects of its design or operation. You'll see in one of the letters from um, neighbors who articulated concerns that there were some water balloons that was used as part of a closing day activity. Um, some of the water balloons got left behind. I think that's unfortunate, but I've seen a lot more than water balloons on residential streets. Um, other than water balloons being left behind, and there'll be, I think, efforts next year to make sure those water balloons are promptly picked up, um, this is solid waste and septic. Um, the septic system is, again, designed for a four-bedroom house. The number of occupants during the daytime doesn't exceed what you'd expect in a four-bedroom house. There's no elevated solid waste generation that's anticipated or has occurred. There are no air emissions other than um, four to five year old children learning to bake um, cakes and brownies. We just don't have any air emissions. So there's, there's no noxious um, impacts off site associated with this. Um, so there has been uh, some suggestion that property values will be uh, affected. May I, may I empathize with you as a board? I'm not particularly fond of municipal ordinances that invite people to talk about how their property values are going to be affected because it invites speculation as to what's going to happen to property values. I will say if you look at the assessor's records and if you look at two recent sales on Channel View Road, you will see that one of the brokers commented to Jeff, he wasn't aware that there was a school in the neighborhood. There, there, there's no opportunity for this use to have the kind of impact that would affect property values. And the fact of the matter is, and I'm actually glad that Mary was forthright in saying to both the neighbors and this board, I've been there for 12 years. If she's been there for 12 years and there have been regular sales, I don't see the property values have been affected. And so I know that competent appraisers, brokers, use sales, comparable sales, and sales activity as an indicator. There's been some sales activity consistent with the size and scale of the neighborhood. Those sales would suggest there's not been an impact on property values as a result of this. So 
uh, again, happy to have Mr. Preble um, detail his conversation with one of the brokers. Um, but the teaching occurs within the home. Um, I think you'll hear from uh, supporters that, um, you know, when they've had others pick up kids, it's hard to find the place. Um, the proposed site plan and layout are compatible with adjacent property uses and with a comprehensive plan. One of the things that this standard addresses is that typically with a conditional use, you've got a new application, a new construction project. This is activity that occurs within a four bedroom residential. And there are no ex exterior changes that are required unless it's this board's prerogative and preference that there be an outdoor play area that uh, frankly only has to be 450 square feet, six kids times 75 square feet. There's about 1,100 square feet on the deck. Uh, Mary and Jeff have used the deck. I had occasion to have Mary walk me through the house and walk me around the deck. That's, that's where kids are allowed to have a little bit of room to roam. And so they've been using the deck. Um, I, I had a colloquy with your code enforcement officer because I'm familiar with how specific the spacing of railings needs to be um, so that you don't have a kid put their head in the, in, in the deck rail and they can't get their head out. I'm particularly attentive to it at my camp because I've now got a grandson who's going to be old enough and I've got to watch out for him. So we shared the perspective that, yeah, most decks built in the 70s didn't have to meet the code requirement of today. I suspect that Jeff and Mary would be most happy to have the code officer take a look and give advice recommendations for what that spacing would need to be. Um, so the fifth standard is uh, clearly met because again, that goes, I think, to new construction. There won't be any here. The design and exter uh, exter external appearance of any proposed building will constitute an attractive and compatible addition to its neighborhood, although it need not have a similar design appearance or architecture. Um, those on town staff that know the uh, assessor and building records better than I do could vouch for exactly when this house was constructed, but it's been there several decades, uh, longer than um, uh, Mary and, and Ben have been at that location. So um, the existing home where the educational program takes place is compatible with the neighborhood and no changes to the house are needed or will be made beyond assuring a fenced outdoor play area if even necessary. So um, I think in summary, um, primary focus meets the home day care standards for the conditional use standards that I've just addressed, but also the additional standards for home day care that are in 19-8-8 on page 257 of the zoning ordinance. First, the hours of operation uh, more than abundantly meets the requirements. The, uh, Mary's hours are much more limited than the hours specified for home day cares in the ordinance. And you can ask her any follow-up questions you have on that, but she's much narrower. She does not operate on weekends and holidays. She follows upon school schedule. Um, second, the fence player area will conform to the minimum number of square feet for up to six children. They're already using the deck. I've had a chance to look at that. I think it more than amply conforms. But again, if there's a preference for using grassed area, I've asked Jeff and Mary to be uh, open to a visit from the code officer, if it be the pleasure of this board, to say the, the outdoor play area has to be something different than what, what has worked for 12 years at that location, which is the outdoor deck. Third, uh, Mary does not conduct primary focus on weekends or on holidays, as I said earlier. Therefore, the requirement that no outside play area occur before 9 a.m. on weekends or holidays is not, doesn't happen. Fourth, adequate lighting is provided in the driveway for pickups and drop-offs. There's no proposed additional lighting. So here are the conditions that we voluntarily come forward. The ordinance doesn't require that we do this, but it does authorize the Board of Appeals to impose conditions. And sometimes it's easier on a board if the applicant comes forward and recommends some conditions that we know we can live with. The first condition on lighting is other than the existing lighting above the garage doors and the main entrance of the house, no lighting shall be installed in a manner that would cast any additional lighting into adjacent properties and any lighting that may be installed for the play area shall be down shielded. And um, again, we make that an enforceable condition of, uh, as part of your review and any action based upon your review. Second, the play area 
although the state does not require any fencing or size, minimum size for the play area, the operator of any home daycare or educational school unit not to exceed six pupils on this property shall maintain a play area of up to 450 square feet. The area will be within the existing decking of the house on the property, or if necessary, in a side yard location to be approved by the code enforcement officer. I will get in trouble with Mary if I tell you that she's cool with the idea of not using the deck because the deck is integral to the structure and is, will be readily understood when somebody for the town inspects the house, but it allows flow through and circulation of kids through various play areas. And Mary's program is somewhat multi-dimensional. She doesn't just work with one room in her house. She works with several rooms in the house. The deck is an integral part of that. Except, I suppose, on those days when inclement weather just doesn't allow for it. Uh, third, the exterior of the house. No other improvements are required for the exterior of the house for operation of the home daycare or educational school unit to serve not more than two pupils at one time. We'd be willing to stipulate, have a condition that says don't make improvements um, beyond um, what's already been done. Noise operation of the school is likely to generate only minimal noise, including the voices of a very few four to five year old pupils. The operator will limit noisy outdoor activities to the period between 10 a.m. and 12 noon, 12 p.m. Mary has said it's really 10 to 11.30 that the outdoor activity happens, but she, I, I'm, I said, give yourself a little bit of buffer just in case. You don't want to be committing to 11.30 and something happens at 11.45. The next one is drop off and pick up areas and sessions. If I were in the neighborhood, I just want to know the drop off and pick up can happen in the driveway. Um, and if it can't, they might go down to the circle. Um, but we're willing to stipulate because we're going to have separate sessions that Mary would need to, to stagger her sessions at least 15 minutes apart. So it's three and three at most. And so three drop-offs in the morning, three pickups in the afternoon. Outside activities, the operator should continue to maintain the supervision of pupils uh, to assure safe pedestrian travel from the property to the beach requiring the pupils to hold a common rope with handholds or to all hold hands with an adult supervisor whenever required when walking beyond the property. When I talked to Kathy, she said the requirements for daycare licensing are pretty straightforward. Um, we focus on safety and uh, if there's transportation by the provider by vehicle, a training session. Mary and Jeff have reviewed all the state's requirements with Kathy. They feel more than comfortable that they will abide by and meet all of those requirements. Um, and so um, I think that concludes uh, in the summary slide. Again, in the, in the view of counsel for the applicant, the operation of a home daycare or educational school unit operated on the property by Mary Casey fully satisfies the conditional use standards. With the condition suggested, Mary requests that the board issue a conditional use permit. We thank you for your time and consideration. We know that you will have questions. Uh, you are a very diligent board, and we're happy to entertain those questions. Um, Mary also submits uh, at the very end of this, if anyone would like additional information or would like to discuss uh, any other proposed conditions for the school, um, she can be contacted. And um, so um, I'm going to yield to um, the board chair and to the further proceeding, but you can call us back whenever you'd like. Thank you. And you can stand pat because I think what we'll do is we'll proceed with some, some questions for you, fair. Attorney Ham Hamilton and, and to, to Ms. Casey. Um, and I, I'll lead off. Uh, and, and I understand you're speaking with the state, which is a good thing. I, I don't know a lot about state licensing of daycares, but what I do know is that it's, it's relatively extensive. Um, there's a fair amount of state involvement given given incidents over the past 10 or 20 years within the state, and I'm curious as to where you are in that in that licensing process. There's uh, three steps that need to occur. One is a site visit by the uh, state day daycare licensing officer. Kathy came to the house last Tuesday. Um, very satisfactory review. I talked to her about that. We we had asked her if she might come this evening uh, or whether she could write a letter. Um, both um, Kathy and her supervisor were clear, we don't do that. <laughs> um, and I think that's very appropriate because what they're trying to do is allow you to do your very distinct and separate uh, local review. You know, one example is the state does not have a fencing requirement for the outdoor play area. I kind of wish they did, because uh, I think it's smart. Um, they don't have a minimum square footage per student. 
So they wouldn't want to come in and be heard to say, you can't do that because you're inconsistent with the state licensing requirements. The, the second thing she has to do is a visit by the state fire marshal's office. And uh, I've looked at the property. Um, I, I, I heard uh, Ben say at the outset in his comments that he's been to the property. I, I, I've worked with the state fire marshal's office for decades. I don't see them having a foundational concern. If they do find something, um, as an engineer, my suspicion is Jeff is going to be on it in terms of making that improvement to the house. But I don't expect anything extraordinary. The third step is they'll want to defer and find out what your decision is. They won't act until they learn of your decision. And so they're not putting the onus on you. They're just, they, they have a regulatory framework that says we let the local community express its view first and then we can act. But she was clear with me. The reason I'm not committing to what we'll do, and she, I'll share with you discreetly, she gave me no pause in terms of whether the license would issue, but she did say, got to have SFMO review, and I've got to have the local decision. Um, and so sometimes it's easier, because I've served on local boards, to say, well, the state's already taken care of it. Here, I think there is that sense of caution that the chair um, has encouraged with his remarks around, you know, these, these are pretty precious individuals. And uh, Mary certainly knows that. She pays attention to those issues. But um, the state does not want to get over its skis as to local review, and so they don't. And I think uh, Ben could confirm their, their issuance of a license is contingent upon hearing of what your decision is. Um, so uh, I leave it there. I understand that. And thank you for the, the detail. And, and to be very honest, the reason I ask the question is because any conditions that the state may place upon approval of this particular site as a daycare or nursery center or whatever it ends up being classified as right. could change the layout, ingress, egress, et cetera. So it's, it, it is, it's good, it's good it's, to hear it's that. It's possible in theory. It's not likely in practice. Um, but I think I'm going to look at Jeff and Mary as I say this because I don't want to get over my skis. But I think Jeff and Mary would submit as a condition of local approval, any condition that the state would impose as part of licensing. So if you want to cross condition your local permit with what the state would require, I think that zone of safety makes sense. So you, you, you both okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Other questions? Um, I've got a few, just Please. real quickly on the application. Um, the application lists the type of sewerage disposal as public, but I believe you said it was septic. It's, it's, it's private septic. Do you, do you know the age of that system? Uh, Recent inspection or? If not, it's a, a, it is public. You're on public sewer. Yeah, that was my mistake in the so, I'm, I'm going to defer to town staff just for a second here because um, I got to say, within the applicant team, I, I think it should be darned obvious. We asked the client, do you pay bills to either the town sewer or to a sewer district? And they said no. That leads me to believe it's private septic. But you may have superior records, and I'd just assume be consistent with whatever records the town has for that entire street. Um, do we know whether that street is sewered publicly? Most of that street is sewered. Okay. There, there are a couple houses on that street that are on septic. Yeah. I don't, I don't know them specifically. Okay. I don't have them in my records. But if the bill would be paid to Portland Water District administers our sewer system. Yeah, I do that. And so there's both the water and sewer. The, the, there'd be a water and That's sewer. A great tip, then. There'd be a water and sewer but, component. But it's one to bill, bill, I believe, right? It's, one, it's only one bill. Yes. Correct. Yeah. So just to be clear, for the for record keeping purposes, the testimony of the applicants is that they, they believe public. they are on public water and so on. Yes. Okay. If it turns out to be different, I'm happy to pivot in either direction um, to, to answer your questions. Okay. Way, so. Th yeah. that, that was a relatively minor one in the right. grand scheme, but it, it was an inconsistency, so I thought I would try to uh, nail that down. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, all right. So a couple of questions about the application, and this is just what I pulled from the state, and so I'm not going to guarantee that they have it right. Um, but I just I did a quick search of, of licensed daycares in Cape Elizabeth, and, and this is noted on their system as having been applied for uh, with the date of June 20th. And the application type is listed as child care facility. There are three, I guess, types of applications. There's a home daycare, child care facility, and nursery school. 
Um, so I was curious if that was just how the state lumped it, if you were doing it as a child care facility, um, and if there were any differences in those. And it looks like within Cape Elizabeth, there are a few maybe similar um, centers that are listed as home daycare, and there are a few of the larger centers that are listed as a facility. So I, I didn't know, one, if the state had listed it correctly on the application, and two, if there was any thought that went into the type of application that was put forward. I, I believe we're home daycare. Um, and um, so, <laughs> let me just pause. I'd rather be quick okay. than quick. And again, this was just what I pulled from the state database, so I'm not making any <laughs> no, representation I, that what's on there is, is actually what you submitted. Kathy was pretty clear with me that um, six was a cutoff mm -hmm. that Mary has stipulated to. And for that particular category, I believe it's home daycare. If you're above six, you bump into a child care facility. We don't want to be above six. No, right. Okay. Kathy had said to me, Yep, so here's a further clarification. Um, so um, based upon some capable research that uh, my colleague Sam had done, um, the first licensing category is family child care program. Uh, they would issue a certificate to provide care for three to 12 children. Again, as we've already proposed as a condition of this board's review, we would stipulate to no more than six. So we're in a broader category in terms of state licensing. But we'll stipulate down to six. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so a couple other questions that, that go to licensing. First, has this particular care, daycare center, home daycare, in the last 12 years, has it ever been licensed? No. Okay. Um, has it ever been inspected by the state, by state fire marshal, by local fire department? Okay. Um, I mean, I have to ask, is there any reason why not? <laughs> so Mary, step right we, we, we want an honest answer to that question, so come on. If I knew then what I know now, I would have asked for a license a long time ago. But um, I really thought that the state would come in and look at the school and say, there's no way you can have a school here. You can't have a school with a staircase. You can't have a school where you take the kids to the playground. You can't have a school without a play structure. So because I didn't get any complaints and parents never asked about my licensing, they asked about my credentials, I just thought it, that it, it would be all right to keep going on the way it was. However, now that Kathy Paglio has visited the school and has looked at it and has high respects for it, she really, really liked it and said it was great and that she's ready to issue me, issue me a license. Um, I just thought, well, wow, that's great. I wish I would have done this a long time ago. I had just thought that she would change the school so much where I wouldn't want to teach in my home or that she would just say, you just can't teach in this house. But she said it was okay. And um, she said the only thing that is stopping me now is, is this, is this process right here. Oh, and she also said that I, I, it is, it is uh, I do need to stick to, she thought that I wouldn't want this. She said you must stick to six and below. And she thought that that would, uh, make me want to not have the school and it's exactly what I want. So it's just been a, it's just been a really great process so far and, and very easy. It's just a matter of uh, paperwork and the fire marshal visiting. I I'd just like to supplement that slightly because I think it's a, both a necessary and appropriate question. Um, I've done a lot of land use and environmental permitting for a long time. And 
when you make an honest disclosure to all of your neighbors and to this community, I've been operating for 12 years, you dig in a little bit and you ask questions. And so I, I said to Mary, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be shocked if a board member asked you that question. You need to think about that. And what I heard was not just subtle anxiety, extreme anxiety. Not because of anything insidious or malicious uh, or bad about what was going on at that facility. Um, and what I've learned from each of Kathy and Ben is the requirements haven't been applied very often in this community. There's one other daycare that was just recently uh, permitted as a new daycare in this community. Um, and one other concern I have sometimes if, if I'm working with a business owner, and I really don't think I'm working with the typical business owner here, it's really somebody who's trying to work with four to five year olds to prepare them for kindergarten. So I view it more in the nature of, although it's deemed a private school, it's more in the nature of a public good from, from my perspective. Uh, but I quiz business owners on the question of, did you get an unfair advantage? And I can't see that there was any particular advantage. If anything, I think there's a little bit of embarrassment and egg on the face associated with having done this for 12 years and not having a license. Um, and I think what happened here was Kathy and Ben were rigorous, clear, but fair in the way they conducted their reviews. And they've left both Mary and Jeff with the sense that good public servants have said, you've got to do this. We're not going to look into the rear view mirror hard to say, why didn't you do it 12 years ago? In 12 years, that's a pretty big admission. I wouldn't have made that on behalf of this client. The client made it for me, and it made it much easier for me to appear before you and say, we're clearly not hiding anything. If we were trying to hide something, she wouldn't have put 12 years in that letter. So I, I feel good about the fact that Mary and Jeff have been treated rigorously but fairly and said, you need to get into compliance with having a conditional use approval for this use and secondly, having the state license. And I'm satisfied having talked with each of Kathy and Ben, who's been very clear. I can't speak for the board. And I said, I'm well familiar with that. The board's going to make its own decision. But he has walked Kathy um, through the process at the state level. He's walked Jeff and Mary through the process on the local level. And so both the state licensing agent and these applicants know what the requirements are. But I just wanted to be real clear, because that is the question to me of the proceeding, is why for 12 years? And I wanted you to have the honest answer from, from Mary. I, I appreciate that. and. Um, and I really, I, I just have one other question, I think, at this time, and that is, have you been carrying proper insurance, and do you currently carry insurance for this use? And is that a requirement of the state? Is that, maybe, Ben, do you know if that's a requirement of, of the town? It's a local requirement. Okay. We've, we've looked at the 33 pages of the state's um, daycare licensing. It's not, insurance is not mentioned. Um, I, I, okay. think, I, I think it's a great question, but I, I want to be specific to your question. Does the state require it? Yep. don't see it in the regulations. Okay. I, I'd be happy to inquire of Kathy to make sure, and I think I will just to be sure, but thank you. Yep, and thank you. I have one question for the applicant. Um, oh, um, why did Kathy restrict it at six children? Do we know that? The state? Um, I've gotten pretty clear that the state licensing category is three to 12 students. What, what uh, Mary was concerned about is that um, Kathy was saying to, to her from a business perspective, if she was doing this as a straight business, why would you limit yourself to six kids? You know, if you had 12 and it's a system that you could uh, have compensation for each pupil, why would you limit yourself to six? What satisfies me is there's a, if there was a business motivation to this, and I don't think there's a pure business motivation, 
The sixth limit is designed to say, I want the attention to the educational curriculum so that these students shine. So the six is voluntary. Um, it's not the state cap. The state cap is three to 12. I, un I understand that. I, I believe the applicant stated that Kathy had told her six, no more than six. I'm just curious why. No, I think Jeff can clarify. There was can you go to the microphone, please? If, if I could interject for a minute. I believe, I believe Kathy said that to respect our local ordinance because she, and Kathy's been, she tries to be very respectful of town rules. Okay. So she immediately contacted me and said, so that's where that comes you know, from. before I get in depth with them, I want to know what is possible to be permitted in Cape Elizabeth. So I believe she went back to you and made you aware of the six cap coming from me. And I do, I, I have found that the, the state is three to 12 for these because other people that get permitted, they get frustrated and say, how come, how come the state allows 12 and you guys keep me at six? I hear that a lot, so. Yeah, so you're drawing a distinction between a home daycare up to six under the ordinance versus above six you be a daycare. And that, that carries a, a different licensing process globally than, than a home daycare. Just, just to be clear again, I think you've heard a call, but we're, we're stipulating we don't want to ever be higher than six. No, I, I understand that. I was just curious why, where that number came from, from Kathy, the state. But yeah, can't answer yeah. that. Thanks. Just one, one question. I, I mean, I'm getting the impression that with, as far as the state is concerned, this is pretty much a done deal. Uh, I, what I, one thing I, I don't I don't know the answer to is is Kathy here is she the final decision maker for the state or is that just are you just going off her recommendation? Uh, so I do believe there may be one rung in the ladder higher than um, Kathy, but I believe it's a function where she checks in so regularly with her supervisor that she has a sense of where it is. And by the way. I, Mr. Barbieri, I need to be very careful here. I'm not going to be quoted to Kathy as saying that this is a done deal. That is my inference from my conversation with her, but she would not want to be quoted. I wouldn't want to get her in trouble with her supervisor as saying it's a done deal. That being said, the State Fire Marshal's Office review is a pretty routine review against um, known and specific codes. Uh, secondly, We've looked at the licensing requirements. Most of what Jeff and Mary have been working on is paperwork. And so I'm not uncomfortable with the inference you attributed to me, but please don't quote me to Kathy saying I said <laughs> the license is going to issue. So I'm just being careful on behalf of her because I respect her. She was very, very thorough, very civil, and very respectful in our conversation. Well, I mean, it sounds like the state is withholding its approval to to we're done, so right. I would think that normally the state would be a little skittish about committing themselves in advance of, really in advance of our Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's local deference, as Ben has described. That's the inference I drew from my conversation with Kathy. She's, she's gonna defer to the town to make its land use decision first, and then the state licensing can happen. And I think it will happen, but I'm not quoting that or attributing it to Kathy. I'm just, that's my inference from our conversations. Yep. I just have a couple questions as well. Sure. Um, not sure if it's substance or procedural. I'll just say it's procedural. Sure. Um, in the presentation, there's a, a phrase, uh, primary focus. Now, is that an, a corporate entity or just a phrase? It's, it's, a, D, it's a DBA. Okay. Yeah. So the, the, bit, the school is not incorporated? Correct. <laughs> Earlier, the question is that there's no insurance. Now, is the contract of the parents of the students is a written contract, and is the, uh, the contracting parties the parent and you personally? So, oh, to hand that. Go ahead. yeah. So, I, I've encouraged as part of the full, full compliance effort of Jeff and Mary that what I know from the letters of support and some of the parents that I've talked to is there no there is no issue as to consent. But I've given them the conservative legal advice. You're always going to be in better position if you have things in writing. So we'll have that conversation. 
I actually appreciate your question because it reinforces some, some of the legal advice I'm giving to the client. Well, I, I asked a particular question. I want to make sure you answer sure. as best you can. Yeah. Does the school have a contract with the parents that's in writing? The, the state um, uh, home care, daycare licensing requirements don't require it. Mary, um, I can tell from her style, doesn't like to impose that rigor. Um, but I'm going to have a conversation with them about my legal advice because I think it's 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 helpful in case there's ever a dispute. Uh, okay. Thank you. If there's a claim by a student mm -hmm. raised by the parents, what happens then? So what, who does the parents sue? So there are lots of lawyers in this room um, who know what happens in lawsuits. Um, I'm, I'm not going to try to dispense legal advice outside of the standards the board has to apply. I'm not trying to be evasive. I just think that is a very broad question that requires a lot of detail to the answer. And I'd prefer not to dispense legal advice in a land use proceeding about um, you know, um, responsibility, whether it be tort or, or, or civil contract. So I'm raising these questions because this is more of the substance of the underlying issues here. I, I know that this is a, a conditional permit, a conditional use permit, but I'm troubled with the business side of the application. Um, and it goes into a, a couple of other um, legacy issues. Um, you mentioned the issue of fencing. Could you, on one of the pieces of paper that's been submitted, show me where the fencing is in the backyard? Um, I've been clear in the supplement to the application, the, the rail is associated with the decking, and I fairly carefully walked all the way around the outside of the deck. There's rails all the way around the outside of the deck, but I wouldn't consider it to be a fence. I would consider it to be a sufficiently high rail to guard against the risk of a four to five year old um, falling from the deck. It's apropos of the question I heard of the prior um, application, which is, does the deck have rails or is it an open deck without rails? This deck is open, but it's with rails. And I think the rails may be code compliant, but I didn't have a ruler with me to check the gap in, of each of the rails. And I'm not troubled by the fact that Mary is not operating as a business. I've seen many home daycares. Um, my mother happened to be a child protective uh, staffer for the Department of Human Services. My wife is a director of municipal public health. And I can tell you that you need private sector participants like this that give of themselves. Is, is, is it a good idea not to have contracts? Probably not. But is it a requirement to conduct a daycare? No, sir. So I'm not troubled by it. You, you, you know, you and I can have a respectful difference on that, but I, I differ from you. I don't think this is a land use review that gets into business practice. There's nothing in the ordinance that says she has to conduct this as a business, and I don't think she wants to conduct it as a business. There's a provision that talks about conditions to the conditional use permit, and yep. that's where I'm thinking. Okay. Um, we, if you're not aware, that's actually I can cite it to you, but that's what I'm thinking as well. Okay. Um, on page, do you have the code in front of you? Yes, I can. I'm referring to the section on page 247 dealing with fencing. Page 247? Yes. Yep. Assuming that you have the I do. September 2017 edition. Yep. Um, bullet number two down at the bottom. A fenced-in outdoor play area shall be provided with a minimum of 75 square feet per child. Now, uh, my math, that equals 450 square feet. That is correct. That's exactly my calculation. Uh, We're in perfect so, agreement on that. Yeah. Are we saying that the, the decking, the enclosed area, is more than 450? It's approximately 1,100 square feet. Correct, Jeff? And that's why when you're talking about the railing, that you are equating the railing and the enclosed area as the fenced in area that satisfies this provision. Yeah, it's, it's almost as though I would have liked to have taken this board to a site visit because I had the distinct advantage having visited the home before this meeting to realize how that school functions within the home. And there are sliding glass doors 
that are providing the opportunity to go from one room inside the house to the outdoors and for kids to be able to move around. And anybody who's had toddlers that are between the ages of three and five um, uh, or older than the toddler age, I should be careful. Um, other people have much better um, um, knowledge than I do as to exactly what different developmental stages mean, but they're pretty busy. And so I think Mary works with that busy stage of development and does not try to constrain it unduly. Um, when I talked to Kathy, I, I asked her the question, do you think the home setting is safe? She said yes. I would point out that the condition of approval that we proposed to go to your uh, question number, Katten, is it? Is that how you pronounce your last name? That's fine. Well, how do you pronounce it? Katen, excuse me, I apologize. So if you look to the condition that we proposed on page 16, um, condition two, Although the state does not require any fencing or size for the play area, the operator of any day, home daycare or educational school unit uh, not to exceed six pupils on the property, meaning the, the property of Mary and Jeff, shall maintain a play area of up to 450 square feet, either within the existing deck of the house on the property or in a side yard location to be approved by the code officer. If this board does not have the ability itself to make a site visit to implement um, the requirement on page 247 of the ordinance, I think the board might ask the code officer to make sure that that requirement is administered. That's the difference between doing it on wood decking versus grass. Um, actually, I think it might be more disruptive of the neighboring uses if it's in the grass area as opposed to the deck. Again, you'd have to see the configuration of the property to understand exactly what I'm saying there. There'd be more noise, there'd be more activity occurring right next to the immediate neighbor who has written a letter of concern, and we're trying to be empathetic to that neighbor. My last query is... Yes, sir. The, the previous 11 years, operating the, the school without license and without the conditional use permit, do you believe, on behalf of the applicant, that meeting the requirements by the state, the file marshal, submitting this application resolves all non-compliance issues? I, I do because I had um, specific careful conversations with those who are in an enforcement um, context, both at the state level and the local level. And um, I think the philosophy matches where the board is, is proscribed and limited uh, and where you need to go this evening. I don't think you can reach back as though you're the enforcement authority for the prior 11 years. I've thought a lot about this. Um, we've been forthright with this board because the last thing I will do is make a misrepresentation to a board where I appear as counsel for the applicant. But I would have to say to you, um, both Kathy and Ben have said, we look forward. We don't look back. What's important to us is that this facility get licensed there are, and Kathy was clear about this, there are applicants that are before her as a matter of state licensing after they've been dragged there by the Attorney General's office who don't want to comply with the idea of licensing because they want to defy the idea that the state can license them. That's not this applicant. And so I think with all of the remarkable effort that's been undertaken over the last two months. Um, the, the embarrassment, the uh, coming forward and being forthright, um, the soul searching that Mary has done, um, and I think you've heard it tonight, I think that's enough. And I think what's most important is for this board to make the land use decision that's before us. It's not the prior 11 years, that's an enforcement question. The question for tonight is, as it stands today, does this operation, this activity, meet the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance? And I believe it does. But I appreciate your question because it's one that I wrestle with, and I've done both enforcement and permitting work. We're here tonight for the permitting question. The enforcement question is separate and apart from the permitting question. And I thank you for your questions. Your questions are excellent. You, 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 you didn't disappoint me, you challenged me. Thank you. 
Any further questions for the applicant at this point in time? And as I mentioned, the previous application and the, to the previous applicant, we will of course reserve the right to invite all of you back up to the podium for further questions to the extent that we have those. I'm sorry, may I just ask one question of the applicant? Yeah. Uh, my question would be, um, how many complaints have you actually received over the past 12 years? None. Nobody? No, except for, except other than, than this whole process, none. There was a complaint that led to the captain being in touch with them and then saying you got to have a conditional use permit for the chiefs. Oh, yeah. But other, other uh, than that one complaint. Yeah, no, no neighbor. The captain and then have said six and a half years, been with, you know, capable of either state licensing or local review, not one complaint. So the testimony that was that there's only been one complaint over the past 12 years, and that was the recent one that has led to this process. Yeah, there was a conversation with a neighbor that will come forward, I'm sure, this evening. I'm not sure that that would reach the code of law. If it did, um, I think we can be responsive to that once it's raised. But uh, I don't want to misrepresent to the uh, board. There could be some suggestion that there was a conversation historically. Just, just to put this on the record, I think the nature of the conversation was with Jeff and not with Mary, and the question was, um, what, what, what about a permit? And um, I think it was at a time historically uh, when they had moved, um, it was either prior to the playgroup chapter uh, and into the uh, conduct of uh, the operation for more than three or four kids, and I think the question was asked, why not a permit, Jeff? Um, he said, I, 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 I need a permit so that kids can play together at my house. And so there's this sense that you'll get that folks think that Jeff is deceiving. That's not my conclusion. I've talked with Jeff. I know, based upon how he's both answered my questions and challenged me, he's not capable of deception. That has to be in the mind of someone else. So. I'd ask you to have him back if you have a question once that comes forward, but I want to be forthright with this board. You're going to hear about a conversation. I think there's been more about that conversation than really is fair to the people involved, but I'll leave it there. Mr. Chair, just can I follow up real quickly just um, with the code enforcement officer just to confirm that other than um, this the, the discussion that led to this process, in, in your um, knowledge, have there been other complaints to either you or other people within the town in the six and a half odd years you've been here? I have no documentation of a prior complaint. Okay. I just wanted to put that on the record as confirmation, so thank you. If you would just step to the microphone, sure. to do about noise. The operator, I'll just read it. The operator will take tangible, us, will take tangible actions to reduce the noise coming from the school, document those actions with date, time, and whatever action we took, and report, if it's okay with you guys, we'll report once a month to uh, the code enforcement officer that we did these things to make, make it quieter. Uh, the other, other thing I want to elaborate on is that when we spoke with uh, Kathy Paglio from the state, she said there was a oh, first, uh, no, we don't have any written contracts with um, the parents. We give them a kind of introductory package and this is what we're going to be doing, but there is no written contract. The Kathy Paglio let us know that um, uh, we have to have a process that has assigned um, something similar to a contract. This is how we're going to um, operate the uh, home daycare. These are the conditions under which we're going to operate, and we want you to sign it. And then we, we get the parents to sign something that amounts to a contract. That's part of the requirements for the state. So, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. We will move on to public comment. Uh, 
and uh, I'm not even going to bother asking Mr. McDougall about email and written submissions. I will represent that we have gotten a number of them. All of those have been dutifully distributed to all of the members of the board uh, by Mr. McDougall and by his staff. We've all had an opportunity to review and consider the comments made in those emails. And I think Mr. McDougall can affirm that, that those emails have all been included with the file, so they all are of record. I know that um, Attorney Hamilton had referenced providing us with, with copies of those emails, and so I, I think that's unnecessary. I believe that we do have, have all of those. To the extent you wanted to submit a packet so that, so that uh, Attorney McDougall could cross-reference and verify, that's obviously you're welcome to do that. Um, then at this stage in the game, we would open the floor up to public comment. Now, to the extent you previously submitted an email, your comments, your concerns, uh, your, in, in many cases, your ratification of, of, of uh, Ms. Katie, Casey and her operation, they are of record. That being said, if you did submit an email, but you nevertheless want to make comment, you're of course welcome to do that. Uh, and of course, anybody who's here this evening who didn't have the opportunity to make any submissions via email, uh, anybody who is here tonight is welcome to, to make a comment on the record, regardless of whether you submitted e an email or not. So I would invite um, members of the public here uh, to come forward and, and offer your thoughts on the application. And we'll just try to keep it as orderly as possible one at a time, and, and uh, I don't think we'll have to I don't think, no cutsies, no cutsies, right? Is that what you say? Mm -hmm. You don't say that anymore. <laughs> and, and if you would, just please state your uh, name when you come up, too. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak on behalf of Primary Focus this evening. My name is Allison McLaughlin, and I am only one, author, one of the authors of over 25 letters written supporting Primary Focus. As a parent of two graduates of Primary Focus, I cannot overstate what Mary has done for my children's confidence and their overall outlook and approach to school. Mary's students don't just learn the lessons that she prepares, lessons that, by the way, she, thanks to the small class size she, cater, she tailors specifically to each of her students, Mary's students learn that they can learn. Through her individualized attention, Mary's students learn that it is okay if students learn in different ways or at different times, or they learn that their learning, oops, <laughs> and they learn that their learning is just as important as the fastest learner, the youngest learner, or the learner who is already on the second Harry Potter book. Like imprinting on a baby duck, the kids see Mary's energy, her enthusiasm, and her utter delight in their accomplishments. And that becomes their point of reference for trying something new, for figuring out a new concept, for acquiring a new skill, and for taking pride in their work and in their accomplishments. Because I could probably go on about the fun my kids have had with Mary for a long time, I want to change gears and address some of the specific concerns that are at issue tonight. First, property values. I'm not an expert, but other than seeing kids outside engaged in supervised play from time to time, there's no indication that there is a school at Mary's house. So much so, in fact, that the first time I sent my parents to pick up my son from primary focus at the end of the day, despite their ability to use ways at a pretty high level, I still got a phone call from them from their car, which was parked right outside their house, declaring that they had no idea where the school was and I had given them the wrong address. Mary's yard is always tidy and I've never dropped my kid off in the morning and had any clue as to what the outdoor activity was the day before. I wish I could say the same for my yard. Second noise. My husband and I moved to Cape in 2008, several years before our first child was born. Cape Elizabeth is an extremely family-oriented town, and Broad Cove is the epitome of a family neighborhood, an idyllic community to raise a family. The sound of children playing and enjoying the outdoors is an asset and a welcome feature of the neighborhood as a whole. Third, traffic. Based on my most conservative estimate, last week I drove to and from my own house approximately 9,387 times. 
hyperbole aside, and I certainly mean no disrespect because I do appreciate the concern. Based upon my own experiences, I have rarely been unable to park my car in Mary's driveway for drop off or pick up. There just aren't that many of us. And because the school is so small, it takes but a moment to bring your kid inside and get them settled or pick them up at the end of the day and then get moving. Mary's school is a hidden gem. She provides a tremendous service to our children that is far more than learning the letters of the alphabet and the sounds of the vowels. She is setting the stage for a love of school and a desire and appreciation for learning. Please, please let her continue her work. Thank you. Thank you. So I am Tina Rada, a neighbor of uh, Mary and Jeff, and also um, I have three kids who attended Primary Focus. Um, I, I did. I was surprised by my reaction when Mary got up here to talk tonight. I was bawling. I don't know if you saw me <laughs> um, when I saw the pictures because I was, or my children were part of that first play group that. Um, kicked off primary focus and I have twins that are now um, in 11th grade so we are going to start the process of looking at universities and what are they going to do and it's amazing to me that um, we were part of that beginning and it was so vitally important for my kids um, having twins you can see the a contrast between different styles of learning. And my daughter is a very, um, you know, sort of probably a typical learner. Um, and my son is not. And um, he's a very hands-on learner. Um, and Mary created a foundation for both of those kids that is so strong and so important. Um, one thing that we have heard over the years, particularly with my son, is despite his lack of attention or desire to keep moving or do whatever he's doing, he stands in the face of, um, or it's a direct con contrast to, to how he can sit and read a book and how he loves to read. And they, will often, they would often say through the years, I hate to tell him to put the book down, but he wants to just read. And it really is a complete contrast to him as a, um, as a student, and it's remarkable. I um, could not say enough about how important that school has been. I really, really hope that you will look beyond the small things. I'm also, not the small things, I know you need to clear through regulation, that all makes sense, but um, the um, other point I wanted to make is that I'm also a neighbor and I lived behind Mary and Jeff through the woods for many years, and we moved sort of down around the corner, now we're on Macefield, but before we were on Hunts Point. And um, we would walk through and around the neighborhood. I have never been held up by traffic or noise or anything that felt uncomfortable related to the school in any way. Um, and we were, my family and I were talking the other night, and when we think about the construction traffic and the yard, um, you know, the landscapers that come through and park in the road and you're trying to go around and like the things that are constant that our neighbors put us through and we just deal with because we, you know, we live in freedom to have our homes and take care of them or whatever. So I want to put that out there too because I think it's important that, you know, as a neighbor of, Cape, uh, of Mary and Jeff, I, um, you know, they, stellar. There's been no, no issue at all. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to remind members of the audience, I, I don't think there's any question about the value of the educational program here. Um, this board uh, 
we're not the school board, so we really do want to focus uh, on on the conditions that, that we need to address here tonight. Uh, but we do we appreciate the comments. Understand that it's a very valuable educational program. There's no question about that. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Kathy Lelouch, and I've lived on 10 Channelview Road for 21 years, and Mary and Jeff have been my neighbors. And I agree, it's without question, she has great passion, and she cares a lot about her children. But there are a number of things that I just want to touch base on, just in awareness. Um, when, they, when she started her play group, and it slowly evolved into something more, I really didn't know what was happening across the street, but I trusted them that as it appeared to be a little school happening, I assumed, because I trusted my neighbors, that it was a licensed facility and met all the requirements for a licensed daycare or a school. I saw that several years back she had advertised in the Cape Courier. So again, I assumed, because that goes to integrity, it goes to trust. And then I got the letter in the mail about the application. And I have to tell you, I was disappointed. I was disappointed that all these years, I thought it was a licensed facility. I, without question, knew that she was doing good things. The people here that are supporting the school, that's great. But how many of you live on our street? How many live on Channel View Road? You don't. Over time, every year, there's a different group of children so there's different type of traffic patterns, but it has been at times obstructing me to back out. I don't complain. I'm a quiet neighbor. I don't want to cause problems because I know every day is a different day. But I think it's really important to know the people that have been in our neighborhood and we stay there is because we like the way it is. To say that there's a licensed daycare, going to the real estate when you bring that up, that they talked about the value of our houses, well, we don't have a licensed daycare. So why would that come up when you're selling your home if it's not even licensed? So these are the few points that I really wanted to bring up. Again, it's not about your school, Mary. I know you do wonderful things. But when you asked the question, I didn't know that I had a choice. I never complained because I didn't know I had the right to say anything. That's my fault. I should have asked the questions. But I trusted my neighbors. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Brian Rayback. I live on Layton Farm Road. Uh, I'm here in support of the application tonight. We sent two of our kids to the school that Mary runs. And so we had quite an opportunity to observe how it operates, how it fits into the neighborhood. Um, in short, the school fits. It's an appropriate use for the area, as far as I can tell. Um, you guys have asked really good questions about how she runs the business. Uh, I can see Andy has some work to do on, on the business advice. but. As the chair suggested earlier, you've got a job to apply a certain set of standards in your ordinance about conditional uses. It's not about whether she's running a good business. It's not about whether she meets the state standards. It's about whether she meets the conditional use standards. And I think she does. I want to share just a few things from our experience. Um, first and foremost, uh, we have always felt that our kids were safe at the school. The small classes, five, six kids at a time, means the kids are easy to control. Uh, they're always, when you show up at pickup, for example, they're always in the garage or they're in the house. You actually have to physically go into the garage to get the kid out of the school. So you don't have kids wandering around the neighborhood, at least you never did in my experience. Uh, the other point is that those of us who are driving down there, are, uh, her customers, we're parents. These are our little ones there. So we're driving carefully. We're driving safely. Um, we even trusted Mary to do the pickup, right? We had, uh, I heard she's taking kids home now. She used to pick our son up at another facility and bring him to her, uh, to her school. Uh, we always put the car seat, buckled that into her car. We thought he was safe. We felt very comfortable with that. 
Um, regarding property values, I, f I, I think it's very hard to know the school is there. Um, I think it took years for the town to even realize that it was there and that there was a zoning issue we had to address. That creates its own issues, yes, I agree, but what it also says to me is this was not uh, a sore thumb sticking out in this neighborhood. Um, there's no playground equipment. There's no sign. Uh, you know, there's none of that stuff that you would expect to see at a big commercial operation. Uh, and again, you've got small classes, okay? So these are a few kids out in the yard. It's more like a play date or a, you know, a birthday party than it is a school. If you go by Pond Cove any time during recess, you know, you have a good sense of, of the noise that, you know, several hundred kids can make. This is just four or five kids. Um, the garage door, I mentioned earlier during drop-off and pickup, we would go into the garage to pick up our kids. Uh, the garage door was always kept closed, uh, in my experience, other than at drop-off and pickup. So again, it was a way, I think, to kind of seal off the school so that it wasn't noticeable to the neighborhood. Um, the house and yard are nicely maintained, uh, as you would expect. It's her house. It's her business. With respect to traffic, I think it's really very limited. That's always been my experience. Um, the small class size limits just in and of itself the number of cars that are coming through there every day. And in addition, I think Mary's uh, you know, livery service where she's uh, picking up kids and picking up maybe more than one kid at a time actually helps to mitigate that some because you reduce some of the traffic that comes into the neighborhood. Um, pick up and drop off are both during normal school hours. It's not very early, it's not very late when people are more sensitive to the traffic and the noise. And parents, in my experience, just stop for a few minutes. Pull into the driveway, you get your kid, and then you're out of there. Most of us have too many other things to do to stay and linger. And so it's not disruptive. Uh, there's a lot of room in that driveway, and there was never a problem for me. Um, I think this is a great resource. I'll spare you the point about what a terrific teacher Mary is and, and how she got my son, who is a fidgety kid, to figure out how to do his letters. I'll be forever in her debt for that. Um, but uh, I, I really think she meets the standards and I urge you to approve. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. My name is Lindsay Wake. I'll say, I wrote a letter, so that's all still true. But um, my son attended last year and my daughter plans to attend this year. We have her enrolled. And I guess just as a current parent, I would say that I would think I'd speak for everyone whose kids will um, hopefully be with Mary next year, that we are happy to comply with anything. I will do anything for, for my daughter to go there. So parking, driving early, in late, whatever needs to happen. There are only a couple cars there at a time. Um, but, I mean, we know we live in people's with and people want things peaceful. So <clears throat> whatever the stipulations are, I'm sure that current parents will be more than happy to comply. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Betsy St. Germain, and my husband Phil and I live next door at 7 Channel View Road, adjacent to uh, Ms. Casey and Mr. Preble at 9 Channel View. Um, we have lived there for over 21 years and on Channel View and love the Broad Cove neighborhood. We have made lifelong friends um, throughout the neighborhood and we are always engaged in helping our neighbors out because that's what neighbors do for each other. Um, I just want to clarify with Mr. Hamilton that um, I did speak with Kathy Paglio right after I met with Ben on June 20th, so we did have a nice telephone conversation, but I did let her know at that time I was not in support of this application, and, uh, but I did not go into reasons with her because I didn't feel it was her need to listen to um, some, of our, some of my concerns. So I do want to thank Ben because he's been very supportive and um, he's, also been, he's also listened and he's also returned my calls and my emails in a very promptly way. So thank you very much. 
So I want to say that when Ms. Casey did open her daycare 12 years ago, neither she nor Mr. Preble communicated their intentions of doing so with Phil or I, despite the fact that we live directly um, next door and our houses are so closely adjacent to each other. So at that time I called and expressed my concerns with the then code um, enforcement officer, Mr. Bruce Smith. So I also understand that this conversation has been a segue for me. So thank you very much, Mr. Um, Hamilton, for making that introduction about this conversation. Uh, Bruce at that time stated he was not aware of a, of a home dare care business at Nine Channel View Road and said that he would get back to me when he had additional information. He did say that at that time that caring for three or more children or unrelated children in the home would require a license to operate. When Bruce did call and share his conversation with me um, uh, with Ms. that he had had with Mr. Preble, uh, Mr. Preble was asked if there was a home daycare in their home. And Mr. Preble was quoted to say to the code officer, my children can't have their friends over to play. And this was when I observed directly, because the front of my home directly um, uh, looks onto the uh, um, Mr. Preble and Ms. Casey's um, um, home and um, property there. I knew that there were more children than just three unrelated children there. So his response made it, um, it, was very, it was with a lot of shock and disbelief and actually Phil and I still to this day recall this conversation. And so um, it, this conversation by Mr. Preble and the statement he made made it very clear that he did not want to have any further communication about this uh, matter with anyone. I called Bruce on several more occasions, and I've also uh, felt that the town of Cape Elizabeth didn't think my concerns were important. So today I finally feel that I have an opportunity and a second chance to tell you the real facts of living on Channel View next to an unlicensed home daycare and what we have observed over the last 12 years and why this application for a home daycare should not be approved. So per Ms. Casey's application, and I want to speak directly to that application uh, for the home daycare business and how it conforms, you have that information in front of you. Just going to highlight a few th extra things, so I don't want to repeat too much. In regards to hazardous traffic conditions, yes, there's additional traffic. Some people obviously say they're neighbors within the neighborhood, but that's not directly on Channel View, live in our shoes. Um, the traffic to and from. If we're having changes in the traffic patterns, as Kathy had identified, changes every year. There was one year where the school bus came down and picked up children. That never has ever happened coming down Channel View. And I remember that because I was home with double knee replacements that year and watched the activity. Um, and as uh, Mr. Hamilton addressed that the driveway is large enough, it's, it holds three cars and, and then a fourth one horizontally. So uh, there are cars that park down the street. There are cars that do park partway on people's property. Um, they don't just park in front of our house. They park across the street. Uh, parents are waiting for the daycare to open. And um, so uh, there is traffic issues. Uh, Ms. Casey states that there are only no more than six children visiting each day. Um, I have to personally say to you that my friends and my family have witnessed more than six children as well as I have myself. I'm not someone who goes and takes pictures. I'm not someone who tries to watch the activities next door, but it, um, the noise brings you out to see just what is going on. In regards to the unsanitary conditions, yes, there's trash over the years. There's been trash, there's been balloons. Yes, I had to pull that out of my dog's mouth who was having some respiratory difficulties. Uh, we have picked up trash at our front doorstep, in our bushes, and in our front yard. Uh, in regards to adversely affecting the value of adjacent properties, noise is a quality of life factor. It's not just going and having a camp on a lake and listening to boat radios and, and going to the beach and listening to uh, music and other people. This is a collective voice of six children, sometimes more as I've said, and it's the voice of Ms. Casey over those six children and constantly telling them what to do 
and how to do it. So the noise is, is enough so that we have had to not enjoy our front yard, our front breezeway for peace and quiet. We've had to close our front door, we close our windows, and we've actually put in maple trees and nice flowering trees so that we could reduce our visibility and hope to reduce the noise, but that has not happened. I will also say that Ms. Casey uses the neighborhood for entertaining the children, so they're sometimes seen um, chalk on the driveway, in the uh, front of her driveway, in the, on the road, and using other people's properties to sled, other people's properties to walk over and, and look at apple trees or bees and things like that. So in regards to the site plan and layout with adjacent property, again, how are you going to enforce that? Um, what she has identified as the fencing for her outdoor play area, how are you going to really enforce that piece? In closing, the Broad Cove neighborhood has always been a sought after and a very desirable neighborhood to live and raise a family. And almost everyone who lives in Broad Cove is a member of the new Broad Cove Shore Association, whose mission is to ensure that our neighborhood remains safe and protected and friendly. Ms. Casey's home daycare business does not meet this mission. It does not belong in a closed knit neighborhood where noise is a nuisance to the adjacent properties with business traffic flow in and out of channel view and trash on neighboring lawns. This is unnecessary conditions and create unfriendly feelings. Relocating this daycare business out of nine channel view road does not change the integrity of the education and the care that Ms. Casey provides. Ms. Casey and Mr. Preble have openly stated that she has run an unlicensed daycare business out of her home for 12 years. And according to my prior conversations with the code enforcement officer, Bruce Smith, both she and Mr. Preble have knowingly, knowingly avoided compliance with the town and the state government. Just what were the intentions of Mr. Preble when he made that statement to the code officer? My children can't have their friends over to play. What did that mean? Now that Ms. Casey has applied to be licensed by the state as a home daycare, gives us an opportunity to just look at the actions and words of the past, and now let's move forward. And I hope that the town of Cape Elizabeth understands this current situation along with a past record of avoidance of lawful and required regulation will now support the denial of this home day care business in our Broad Cove neighborhood because it's the appropriate thing to do. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, do we ask questions now? Or if you that's fine. Ms. St. Germain, are you comfortable answering a few sure, questions? Sure, absolutely. Uh, I was curious about the balloon incident. I read about it yes. in the email. What, did you feel that jeopardized the health, the health of your dog? I was able to get it out of my dog's mouth, but um, I'm an animal-friendly person, and um, there was a fire in the neighborhood about 15 years ago, and um, I did mouth-to-mouth -mouth re um, resuscitation on a little dog who was caught in that fire. So, and I'm a nurse, I'm an oncology nurse for 40 years. I'm in semi-retired, and yet um, it could have, it could have. If I wasn't there and tried to get it out of her mouth, it could have compromised something. Did you express your concern to um, Ms. Casey after that? Um, when you, you that's a really, me? that's a really good question. Um, I will, I will just want to say that when Ms. Casey and Mr. Preble moved into the neighborhood, um, the communication has never been friendly, and it has often been confrontational. And um, one of the things that I specifically requested of Mr. Smith was to please not document or write down who had um, called to uh, complain about an unlicensed daycare next, um, next door to me. Um, we had quite a dis conversation about that, as I recall, because he felt that it was his obligation, if asked, that he had to give a name. And I specifically asked him not to do that, to please let us see if, um, if he could at least get some information. And I felt that the, the return communication from Mr. Preble was a real shutdown. 
So any conversations about this daycare have um, been zilch because of the confrontational communication we have had as neighbors. So even, even after you thought your child was in danger? Yes, yes, well, I made sure it. that um, I picked up, I have over the years have picked up balloon fragments and trash on my lawn. And you didn't complain about those? Either? I do not um, have, I have minimal communication with Mr. Preble and Ms. Casey, unfortunately. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Any further questions from Ms. St. Germain? Hearing none. All right, thanks. thank you very much. Thank you. Additional comments from the public? Good evening. Good evening. My name is Rachel Perry. And um, I am an abutter. I have lived 35 years at 10 Pine Ridge Road. I'm a backyard neighbor. Uh, I too have experienced uh, toys that I've just thrown back. And you have asked that question about approaching the neighbor. I have found my neighbor also very unapproachable. Um, I have only gotten sass back, so I just throw whatever comes over the rock wall just back over. Um, both my husband and I are retired teachers. We both really believe in preschool education, that it's very valuable for a child's education, but we oppose the location of Mary's school. Licensed home daycares are permitted, as I understand it, anywhere in Cape Elizabeth, as long as certain conditions are met. To quote the Residence A ordinance, uses shall be compatible with the character of the area and shall not adversely affect the values of adjacent properties. The word, the key word, I think, is adjacent. Abutters. Four abutters have opposed this daycare. You have received numerous emails in support responding to Mary Casey's group email. No doubt daycares are valuable assets, but in appropriate locales. You also can read from these emails how boisterous that daycare must seem as one parent in her email refers to wrangling her rambunctious child into their car at pickup time. Once children arrive at Mary's school, the parents go to work, they go home, they go to enjoy the rest of their day, they have several hours that they do not have to listen to their children. They don't experience the disruption or disturbance that occurs for the neighbors. The neighbors are hearing this the rest of the day. According to the ordinance, my understanding is that your mandate, the zoning board's mandate, is to protect adjacent properties. I mean, it specifically refers to not adversely affecting adjacent properties. For adjacent properties, this, this daycare is not an attribute, nor a neutral asset. It is an intrusive detriment. 35 years ago, I would not have bought a home next to a daycare, nor would I now. Real estate agents, and I have notified or communicated with real estate agents, have told me that being in a butter does adversely affect my property's resale value. And none of these abutters have sold their homes. So I don't know how you can say that everything's been steady. And, um, Mary Casey has known she is a disturbance to her neighbors, that her daycare is a disturbance to her neighbors. And hence, I feel that for 12 years, she has tried to stay off your radar. And also the permitting and license, licensing radars. 
In a letter to the neighbors, neighbors, she has admitted that her school is a disturbance that she has tried to minimize. In 12 years, Mary Casey has not successfully insulated her school, nor do I believe she can. I have been bothered, inconvenienced, and troubled in my own backyard and in my own home. In my letter that I wrote to you, I um, presented a, a scenario of trying to read in my backyard, and I hope that you all have read these letters. Mr. Preble, in a letter to a neighbor, states he wishes no one to be bothered, inconvenienced, or troubled. I do hear the intrusive noises of this daycare and the instruction that Miss Casey is giving to these students even when I am indoors. My husband and I also have safety concerns as the daycare backyard slopes downward. It is used as a sliding and playground area. We have a rock wall at the base of this slope. I'm very concerned about what would happen if a child were hurt on this rock wall. You also had a question. You had asked if um, the state official knew about insurances. And I think that the person who uh, would cover insurances and liabilities, that would be the homeowner's insurance provider, whoever that is, would be concerned with the liability issues. So they would probably have to have an expensive rider on their homeowner's insurance policy to cover this daycare. I've seen Mary Casey transporting children in and out of the neighborhood. She could just as well be commuting to her job in a more appropriate locale. Other owners of home daycares in Cape Elizabeth, like at Two Lights and Old Ocean Road, have purposely chosen locations that have not adversely affected their communities. They are not in close-knit neighborhoods, nor on small lots impacting neighbors. Their noise is contained because they have the space around them to disperse that noise, and they are main roads with numerous parking spaces that accommodate the traffic. Mary Casey should have considered a home daycare in such a locale. I've jotted some notes here. Um, I do not feel that um, my neighbors have been forthright about this daycare at all. I, I, I don't know what else to say. Do any of you have any questions of me? Any questions? No, ma'am. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. My name is Edward Perry. I live at 10 Pine Ridge Road. My family bought the property I live in in 1971. Uh, I'm a retired elementary school teacher with over 30 years of experience. Uh, I have a master's degree in public school administration. I certainly believe in the value of <coughs> preschool programs. I'm certain, especially after reading some of the emails and the testimony tonight, that Ms. Casey's program has helped a lot of kids over the years. Uh, I think it's a very valuable contribution to society. However, I don't see a lot of emails expounding on the attributes of having a home daycare in their backyard, uh, which is really the question here. I have no question that the daycare that's been going on behind us is beneficial to people. Uh, I'm happy to see kids go in and, and further their education and set themselves up for a successful lifestyle. I just don't think it works in our particular area, in our backyard. Of course, as adjacent property owners, our major concern is noise, as my wife just said. Uh, it occurs daily, and it's very obtrusive. You, can't carry on a conversation when the kids come out and start their outside activities. Uh, 
But something else uh, concerned us too. I'm sure you can imagine that everybody is concerned about the noise. Uh, the next door neighbors to us who are also property abutters and weren't notified of any of this through some kind of confusion because the actual owner is at the Viking nursing home and the power of attorney lives in Pittsburgh. But I called him up and asked Larry Anderson of 8 Pine Ridge Road if he had any concerns about the proposed daycare. And he talked about his mother and father and they had been alive when the daycare began. And they're, they're older and they're very timid. And they approached us and said, well, what do you think's going on over there? And we, like everybody else in the neighborhood, assumed it's a, it's a daycare, it's licensed, it's been approved, so it's a daycare. So, you know, you weren't gonna do anything about it because it was already an approved town daycare set up. But Larry brought up another interesting point. He said that, gee, doesn't this daycare mean additional liability for abutters whose properties line up with the property from the daycare? What happens if one of these children wanders onto your yard and gets injured? And he said, you'll be responsible for it. And I thought, well, maybe. I called my insurance, homeowner's insurance company. Sure enough. Oh, your property's not fenced in? You don't have no press passing signs? If one of those kids wanders over in your yard, falls on a rock that you've placed in your garden, trips over a bird bath and gets hurt, you're responsible. You're gonna have to alter your homeowner's insurance to cover this. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. Uh, I didn't realize that was gonna be the case. And since I guess we're making an exception that this is not gonna be a fenced in daycare, uh, if I wanna have that protection in my yard, I'm gonna have to bear the expense of putting up a fence. Uh, we're also concerned that home daycares can have up to eight children. And I know it sounds like in tonight's presentation, there's no intention of that. But even as the lawyer suggested tonight, as Mary Casey's lawyer suggested, that there's gonna be additional expenses as you go through the permitting process. The state may come up and say, well, you're gonna be required to do this and this and this. And it's a business. Maybe they don't have written contracts, but I have a suspicion they're not doing it for free. Somebody is exchanging money here. Um, what if the daycare expands into eight to 12 people, which it can have has been looked into? Uh, it seems like it's a much a easier step once the town has given them a permit for three to six students. Well, you know, we've been doing it for a few years. Their expenses are more than we thought. Let's bump it up to eight to 12. And I can only imagine what the disturbances would be like for us as abutters. Uh, all of these concerns seem to point to something that it, it's certainly not increasing the value of our property. And as my wife said, we talked to several real estate brokers and said, yeah, you have two properties for sale. One's next to a daycare and one's not. Which one are you gonna buy? Well, I'm reading the concerns that the town has that they've written down in their ordinance requirements. The five concerns that the lawyer uh, addressed carefully uh, because those are the concerns that you're gonna use and, and consider. And number one, hazardous traffic. Well, I don't deal with that. My, I'm on the next street, Pine Ridge Road. I don't have cars dropping off students at the daycare. I do know that their driveway isn't as large as the lawyer describes it. I would, for the neighborhood, it's like an average to small driveway for three to four cars, but some of the driveways in Broad Cover, you could fit a dozen cars in easily. Unsanitary conditions, I've never experienced that beyond toys flying over the stone wall once in a while. Um, I didn't get the smell of baked cookies like the lawyer said, or the brownies, because that takes place inside the house. Um, I don't think that they can really say, as my wife said, that property values have remained steady. All the, of the three property abutters have stayed in their houses for over 20 years, or the fourth butter also. So I don't know how you can judge that property values are not affected until somebody actually goes and faces a real estate broker and says, you know, what's happening to my property now that it's next to a daycare? Well, I guess really, if I look at all the five things, 
the five qualities that we're supposed to have. The most important thing to me is that the way this is presented is it, everything is described as it all takes place within the home. All educational programming does not take place, does take place in the existing home. It doesn't take place in the existing home. There are outside activities that are the disturbance to the neighborhood. Nobody hears the children when they're inside learning. Nobody disagrees with that. Great. It sounds like it's a wonderful daycare inside the house. Once the children come out, not on the porch, but into the yard and start having these activities where you're watching them slide down an incline with a stone wall at the bottom and you own the stone wall and you're thinking, gee, I wonder how this is going to work out if somebody gets hurt. Uh, or they're playing ball or they're squirting hoses. And it's, it's loud. That's the way kids are. It's just a loud activity. It's nothing to do with the way the school is run. It's just loud activities in a quiet neighborhood. I, I don't see how that improves my property values. Um, I guess all I can say is I think their daycare could use a more appropriate location. I certainly hope for my peace of mind that um, you suggest the same thing. Run your daycare, it sounds great, but have it somewhere else. Don't have it here in my backyard where I have to listen to it every day. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Further comments? We're kind of pulling an all-nighter here, aren't we? Uh, it's I'm past Phil my bedtime. <laughs> all right. I'm Phil St. Germain. I live at 7th Channel View Road. Um, thank you all for the volunteer work that you do for the town. It's important. Uh, you guys kind of act as referees and, and settle this stuff, and, and it's not easy, I understand. Um, just a, a note that I had, I hadn't been prepared for, but you need to be careful. You're going to set a precedent with whatever decision you make. You're going to make a, a precedent that will affect people not only in our neighborhood but others. Okay, uh, my conversation tonight will strictly rate, relate to the issues at hand regarding this application for home business. Assuming that the quality of the program that Ms. Casey operates is not of concern to this board, especially since, let's face it, there are plenty of other spaces this service could function within and possibly even benefiting even more Kate and Elizabeth families if they expanded. Our issues with this application are in no way personal in nature, but are intended to take a case, to make a case that this home business does not fit in our neighborhood and does not meet the requirements for approval. I also understand that the applicant has urged the submission of letters of support for many non-abutters who are customers of this unlicensed business and obviously have something to gain if this business is allowed to operate at Ms. Casey's home, avoiding the overhead of rent. Rent that most likely would have to be passed on to the customers. This should be factored in, I would hope, and urge, as you deliberate, that the preponderance of the weight be given to immediate abutters who are affected to the greatest degree. I also submitted uh, on 718 a bunch of notes affecting value, and that's most of what my talk is about tonight. I think value, um, you know, many of you may have taken economics courses. Um, you know, there's an economics theory about supply and demand. When you go to sell your house, there's only one of them. And you hope that there is one boatload of demand which will help you sell your house at a high price. Inevitably, my argument tonight, as I develop it, is going to be that the buyers will be more limited with a home daycare business right next door. If you're unsure of this, 
and you're trying to make a decision on this, this is, this is what I would suggest. Imagine yourself in the market for a new home in Cape Elizabeth. There are nearly identical homes available, and each meet the needs of your family equally. But one of the homes has an approved and operated daycare business next door. Now ask yourself if this would affect which home you make an offer for. Ask yourself what your offering price for each would be, and would they be different? And what your willingness to increase your offer for each home would be, keeping in mind that they are nearly identical, that they fit the, fam the needs of your family equally, and the only difference is that one home a butter is a family, and the other is a family plus a licensed daycare. My argument is simple. My argument is that it likely would affect your decision. And thus this home daycare business on Channel View Road, if approved, would negatively affect the value of abutting properties. And thus, the application does not meet the standard for conditional use. And thus, should not be approved. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Nicole Tackett, and I'm a resident of Cape Elizabeth. Um, I do want to pile on the point that yes, you are setting a precedent here for other home daycares or schools in the community that are a value to this community, and the children are the future of Cape Elizabeth. And so we talk about property values, and the property values of wanting to invite families and communities to be a part of this community. And people like Mary and Casey and those home daycares are part of that. So when you're talking about precedent, Mary is willing to meet the conditions to continue to have it in her home. So make those conditions that will make, you know, she's willing to, to do that upkeep. But you're making, yes, you are setting a precedent here, and she's willing to set that precedent. But the precedent for not having any home daycares is also going to be set, which is a detriment to our community and the lifeblood of our community because these children are our future. Thank you. You have schools like Maiden Cove, and I don't know where that filters into the whole thing. I don't know when it started and all that. My kids went there too, by the way. I loved it. Or they loved it. But um, that's in a tight, small, very small residential neighborhood. I'm just throwing that out there because you want to hear noise. They have a lot of kids there. It's very noisy. And everybody loves, well, not everybody, but I believe that our community loves that um, facility too. And it's an example of children and a family neighborhood working together. Thank you. All right, I'm not seeing anybody else jumping up. I think everybody has had their say here tonight. Uh, the board will, of course, as I mentioned earlier, reserve the right to ask questions in particular of the applicant as we, as we move into our deliberations, but I think we can agree that it's time to do so. Make sense? I, I think it does, and, and maybe just note that once we close the board to the public, or close the meeting to the public, it is closed. <laughs> It, it, it is indeed closed for, for, yes, for commentary. Right. So no. last last chance. Right, right. If so anybody this, wants to speak. This is the last chance. <laughs> All right, and, and now we've got repeated commentary here, so. I, I get it. But there are daycares all over people's head. There was one in my neighborhood in Oakhurst. There's a little stone wall. Everyone, when children make noise, I mean, they're in our town. It's a classic piece of community, not in my backyard, literally. But it happens, and that, you know, it provides a service, a very valuable service. And if you happen to live in a place where that happens, it does. It's, that's just how it is. It's legal.
so, so I wanted to use the materials that have been filed to just <coughs> respond to all of the comments, but do it in a summary fashion using an exhibit that you should all have handy to you. It's an exhibit B to our supplemental comments. I did. Typically, the applicant gets a chance to respond to what's been said. Um, in the well, that's, that's, that's true in a court of law. You will, you well, will no, agree. Well, no, in the proceedings. Uh, uh, is, is, is the board come? <laughs> there's, no, there's no need to applaud. Um, is the board comfortable with the applicant having a brief opportunity to comment on, on the comments made by the public, or shall we move directly into consideration? I feel as though the applicant did a very ad adequate job of presenting their application and all the salient information. I, I don't know that it's necessary to repeat what's already been said or provided in the written record. Very good. I believe we've read all of it. That would be my thought, too. Uh, and I'm just uh, looking so for a headshot. We don't need a summary. If there's one particular fact that needs to be corrected, then maybe we can do that. I, I don't think and, and, and we could certainly ask any. We, could, we, we so, do have the opportunity to so, ask additional um, questions. With great respect to the chair and the board members, I'm getting the sense that if you can just ask some questions of clarification, I think there was some confusion that, that resulted from the commentary. And I'd like to have the opportunity to put the record straight on some of these points. But I, I, I can defer uh, to your questions, but please post some questions. It's a very diligent board. I'd sure. like to have the opportunity to clarify. There, certainly, I appreciate that. And we will ask any questions if we have, if we have those. We'll move forward. We will then close the public hearing and move into board deliberations. Thoughts of the board? Um, one, one quick question for uh, the code enforcement officer that I didn't get a chance to ask before, before any deliberations. Are there, um, you're aware of any annual fees that the town has? I didn't see any on the, the town website, but is there any upfront licensing fee or annual licensing or inspection fees that you're aware of? No. That are just due to the town. I'm not talking about the state. There's, there's just the fee to be in front of this board. Tonight. Okay. And then one quick follow-up question. Um, it appears to me, again, based on my search of the, the state database, that there are 10 existing daycare facilities, home daycare centers, nursery schools within the town. Is the town inspecting those, or is, is that strictly state inspections? We don't have an inspection procedure okay. for, there's home, no, for home daycares. There's no ongoing follow-up from the town side? With, Correct. Okay. Thanks. Yes, I have a question for Mr. McHugh as well. I, I know this is getting late, and I don't want to be um, here at this point, but you know, I'm a little troubled by, this is for a daycare, uh, permit for, for daycare, and yet the, 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 pro, the project's being held out as a, as a school, and specifically a school, not a daycare. I'm wondering, does that, does that make any difference for our analysis? I mean, if she, let's say this was a karate school, or a tumbling school or something like that where kids, you know, spend three to six hours doing that as their primary activity. And, you know, with some of this other um, playground, play, play time as well. Would that make any difference or is, um, or does, does this need to make a, have a more, does this have to strictly adhere to some notion of traditional daycare? It's, it's my opinion that it fits the definition of a home daycare. I, I think if, if it was a, a tumbling school or something drastically different, it, it could become something else. It would become a, what's defined as a personal service business in the zoning ordinance. Uh, but, you know, we, we have a limited number of definitions in zoning, so when, when we're presented with a concept, we fit it where we, where we see fit. And I think it's the most logical place in the zoning ordinance to fit. It, it seems to me that the, the school designation used by the applicants was more colloquial and, and general, and a general descriptor. Um, I, I agree with the code enforcement officer. I, when looking at the definitional section, it se seems to best fit within the home daycare definition within the ordinance. Okay, well, I was, again, I was asking a question. Somebody wants to go first. 
<laughs> uh, well, look, I'll give my two cents here, and I, I will be quite honest. I don't know where I come out on this at the end of the day, but I'm, I'm, I, I will say I'm a little bit annoyed um, that this has operated for 12 years without being licensed. That's not why we're here today. This is a land use thing, but I, that is a little bit difficult. Um, that has been difficult for me to get over. I think that it, it's not a... You know, there are a lot of different places where this appears, but I mean, one of the first things that I think about is it, in daycare is okay, what, you know, is this licensed? Is this insured? You know, um, uh, some people don't, but it is what it is. Um, you know, but as we sit here today and, and think about all the things uh, before us, um, uh, you know, the, the town has clearly made in the comprehensive plan the concept of home daycares as a public policy goal. That's, I, I don't know that we can necessarily parse where in the comprehensive plan they wanted it. The comprehensive plan says the vast majority of daycares are in residential districts. That's residential zoning districts. They're not in residential neighborhoods. Um, there are 10, this is the 11th, um, daycare licenses that exist out there of those four maybe five, depending on how you look at it, are in true neighborhoods. Um, the rest of them are on Ocean House. They're on Two Lights Road. Uh, that said, it's also pretty clear in the zoning ordinance that it states specifically that they're allowed with a conditional use permit and it does not go through site plan approval. If the town wanted it to go through site plan approval, the town would have written into the zoning code that it should go through site plan approval, and it didn't. And I think that was intentional because there is a greater, like I said, public policy impact that there is a shortage of, of daycare generally and there are different types of daycare. There are centers, there are schools, there's care for infants, there's care for four and five year olds. Um, and those are different things. And you know, look, I read, read the letters of support and the program sounds great. Um, wasn't really concerned with the program. What I was interested in seeing was there was a wide mix uh, of people in the town, people who live in the Broad Cove neighborhood. I live in the Broad Cove neighborhood. It's kind of the opposite side, but uh, there were people who live in that neighborhood and sent their kids to Mary's school and you know, walked there, drove there. Um, there are people throughout town who do that too. So, you know, when I, when I look at this, um, you know, I know the street well. I, I don't perceive there to be traffic issues on that particular street. That uh, circle is wide. I've been on that circle and turned around in it often. I did last night just to do it again, just to say I did. Um, uh, you know, the, the noise, yes, I, I believe there's an issue with noise. Frankly, there's a huge issue with noise in the neighborhood coming from landscapers. I think that that's a much greater issue for the town to address. Um, and I, I don't know what the answer is on that. Um, you know, the traffic in the neighborhood, uh, you know, traffic issues that we've had don't tend to come from parents of small children. Um, there are people who speed through the neighborhood, and, uh, but, but that's not what's going on here. Property values, I got no idea. I mean, <laughs> you know, how, how can you test what property values are? It's been a great market for the last 10 years. People want to live in Cape Elizabeth. People want to live in Broad Cove. Uh, property values have generally gone up. How, how do you know for the butters whether they go up? I don't know. I, I have really no idea how to assess that. Um, I don't know that necessarily living near a daycare is a positive. I don't know that it's a negative. I don't know it's a neutral. Um, I know there have been home sales on Channel View, not of direct abutters. Uh, from what I can see, and I'm not an expert in this, it doesn't appear to have been impactful. Uh, there have been lots of home sales on Roundabout, which again is not a directly abutting road, but it's a uh, you know, block away. Um, those home sales appear to have been very strong. Uh, again, t really just kind of tough to you know for me to make a, a judgment on that matter. I, I do take the testimony and the letters of the direct abutters very, very seriously here. Um, and the standard on property values is abutters. It's not two streets away. Um, so that is something I also place great value on. So with all that, I mean, I, I have some thoughts on this, but I'd love to hear you know, kind of other people's opinions and, and questions that they may have. I, I don't have any further questions. Uh, actually, you know what, I do have one. The deck, I just want to make sure the deck on 
the house appears to be on the side that faces the circle? Okay, I, I just wanted to make 100% sure of that. So thank you. I'm sorry? And the back. In the back, I think. In the back? Statement. It's an L shape deck. Got it. Okay. Um, I didn't realize, is this, are all the uh, uh, appeals going to be this interesting? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. Yeah, Hopefully not. No, this is a particularly juicy one. <laughs> right, 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 right. Just for me, right? Um, right. Just a, a comment about the fact that this was a pre-existing violation. I mean, I, the, the candor was really remarkable. Uh, Ms. Casey just acknowledged if she had said anything, she was, she was afraid she was going to shut down her school. And in this day and age, nobody admits that. The, I honestly believe, and in, 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 uh, Mr. McDougall, you can comment more based on your experience, that, and I, I agree with, with um, uh, Attorney Hamilton on this point, that the, the, the compliance issues and the enforcement issue is different than this permitting issue. And that when you, when you effectively we're dealing with an after the fact permit. And I'm assuming that we have, we run into this problem all the time, where people, you find a problem, you say, um, come and get the permit, and that's pretty much the end of it. Now, uh, this is probably a more substantial type of violation than, than you, you probably see. On the other hand, I think it's not within our discretion to make that enforcement call. And so if, if there was an enforcement call that was to be made, it was to be made on your end or the, the, the town's end and not ours. So I think that, I think we do, while I share, <laughs> I share the concern about you know, getting away with 11 years. I understand the, the neighbors being a little annoyed at that, and feeling misled about that. I don't think that's legally relevant for our consideration here. I think we just have to look at the, at the merits of this of this project. Um, uh, with re again, I'm not going to repeat. The educational value is it's not it's not a relevant consideration. And I jokingly say this that if. It, the, 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 in a way, it kind of undercuts the, the argument because the better the school art, one can make the argument that the more intense the use. So I don't think we even want to go to what a good school this is. I, don't, I just don't think it's relevant. Um, so then the, the, the two issues seem, the two big issues seems to be the, the level of children's play and how, how, how disruptive that is. And, and again, I, I just um, uh, echo Mr. I've never pronounced your name before, Mr. Just. Just. Uh, point that the code contemplates, it contemplates this activity can take place. And it specifically contemplates a play area. And it's, so they understood that when we prove these things, there's going to be play, there's going to be a certain amount of noise. That's just, that just is built into the, the, into, uh, the standard. And so really what we need to be looking at, I think, is whether the noise that's being generated by this particular project is so excessive, so systematic or habitual that it really, we say, well, that, no, this is, this is too much. This is too much for this neighborhood. And I can ask the question about complaints because I understand it's hard to complain to your neighbor. I have a, I have a problem with my neighbor. I want to complain to him. It just doesn't seem worth it right now. Um, but here, uh, this problem, which sounds, you know, people are passionate about it now, and yet somehow for the past six and a half to 11 years, you've been able to live with it. And uh, the fact that you can't knock on your neighbor's door and say, look, you know, maybe we're not getting along, but I just, you know, the balloons, it's, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. Uh, I've, I've talked to my insurance agent, and he thinks that there's a real danger here. What are you, you going to do about that to take care of to take care of my problem there. Um, what about the noise? Is there, is there some way we can, we can address the noise, uh, limit hours? But to not even have that conversation, at some point says this is not that serious a problem. Um, even though it, I'm sure you know, it doesn't feel like that today, but we have to, I think, come up with some kind of evidence. How, how are we gonna, how are we gonna balance 
the, well, you know, the positive and the negative. And that just, it's just something that, um, you know, strikes me. So I think, I think the, the evidence that we're looking for, because some, some play is gonna, is gonna take place, um, you know, on balance, is it something that's kind of within what, what within the contemplation of the statute? I should add, and I don't know where this comes out, that this is if this is conformed to the school year, then the prime summer months, there's no the kids are not out there playing. The time when where most of us are outside, the kids aren't there, as I understand it. And so during a great deal you of know, the school year, I would think also the kids are inside. And Mr. Jameen said, when they're inside, it's not a problem. So it's not like um, you know, this is living next to the freeway either. So I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure where I come out on this, but I, I'm trying to, to, to come up with a way of evaluating, um, uh, evaluating the actual hardship. As with regards to property values, I, I have the same point again about the fact that um, the property values even get gets written into the statute. I mean, if Mr. Germain's analysis were true, that is, would you prefer to have to have or not have a a um, uh, uh, child care next to you, then uh, we can never approve a child care because the answer to that would always be, well, no, I, well, given all things equal, I wouldn't want to have the child care. We can never approve a child care. Um, and I don't, I don't think that was the intent of the statute. And I think we certainly need some hard, I hate to say expert evidence, something to suggest that that's a problem. Is there any, have studies been done about uh, impacts of, of daycares or uh, or um, other kinds of facilities in, in neighborhoods. And I, I did a, my, I, I'm not testifying here, but I, mean, I looked at, quickly looked at a literature survey and the, the, the literature out there is inconclusive. But um, the point is what's been presented before us is also in, inconclusive and seems to me speculative. So, you know, I guess it's, it's a hard one to evaluate, but, um, I'm not seeing the evidence to suggest that this school in particular would, would cause a great diminution in value. So anyway, I'll stop there. I can throw my two cents in and move this along. Um, I think I'm pretty much lined up with everybody else on the issues that really stick. Um, I have a few notes jotted down. One is the, the noise issue, which I think some people will take umbrage to, calling children's noises or din noise. Um, and this is a residential neighborhood and it's dense. And having five children together playing is probably not unusual in this situation. It's one of the ways I look at it. Um, another way to look at it is, um, you know, we also have to consider we don't live next to it. Um, so that's one thought on that. I don't find traffic is going to be an issue and parking can be addressed. It's at the end of a cul-de-sac. Once again, property values are really subjective and speculative, what someone could value. Uh, an, an abutting house is a, a diminution because it has a daycare, maybe a value to someone else. A working family with young children could find that a gain. Um, But really, all I need to chime in. I think I know where I am. And and I I, I think I'm more or less to, to to quote you in line with with others thinking on this. Uh, what sticks out to me as being probably the largest issue is uh, is the effect on property values, as I think we've all hit upon. And and I agree that um, that could be viewed as a benefit by some. Uh, secondarily. It, well, I should say primarily, I feel as though the applicant has proven that there is no adverse effect on property's values based upon the fact that, uh, based upon the limitation of the scope of this. We've got a limitation of the scope of the timing, uh, limited time during, during the day, during the business day, um, uh, really uh, limited time frame when the children are outside uh, and a limited number of children. And I'm not so sure that I would feel the same way if we we're talking about 10 or 12 or 15 children. I, I may come to a different conclusion in that scenario. Um, that being said, Ms. Casey, 
you didn't approach us the right way from the start. But that's that is not my issue. We are here uh, simply to determine whether you can go forward with this. And this is a conditional use for this particular district. This is allowed with some conditions. And in uh, my sense is that the, the conditions here have been met by the, by the applicant. I would just note, Mr. Chair, that even if we were to approve the conditional use, there are additional conditions that the board can seek to impose on this. Um, and so there would, this would be, if it, again, if approved, a two-part um, approval. But one, one thing I just also want to point out, um, the conditional use runs with the property. And, and the conditions to that conditional use run with the property um, under 19.5-5. So uh, as long as it's used for that uh, purpose that's granted, that's something we also, you know, I think need to consider in our deliberations. I agree. And if I'm wrong with about that, then please correct me. But that's how I read that section. Okay. I agree. And I further agree that it's to the extent we do opt to approve the application, um, the proposal that, that we should, should wrap in some additional conditions. All right, I'll go last. Um, I agree with one comment earlier that this is not the way to go for this type of application. Um, neglect uh, is, is probably not the right word to use. Um, it's not like a home business where I'm just going to make, you know, scarves or whatever. Um, this is serious. Um, you've been rather fortunate that there has been no incident. Um, um, I really struggle on, um, on how this is going to go forward for this applicant. As for conditions, going through the list, I'm not really troubled with the, the first. Three, I think buffering and screening is an issue. Um, possibly a stronger light in the, in the front entrance way, you know, in the garage area. Um, we haven't talked about performance guarantees and whether this is something that we should be considering. I mean, it's one thing to say that an applicant comes to us fresh, there's no history. And so, you know, on good faith, we're interpreting the information that's being presented. Now, high marks for coming forward and, and expressing the, the facts. Um, and uh, I, hold, I hold that in high regard. Um, but, you know, that, that's, that's an enforcement issue that, if that comes up. So looking forward, I, I was thinking that if I'm inclined to approve the application, but with, uh, with conditions. Um, one is that I don't believe the decking railing is what we consider a fence. I don't even consider that outdoor fencing area, what's in the code you're talking about. I think what we see is with our neighbors in that area that um, they're older citizens, which means that they may have more free time at the house in that neighborhood. So there's a sensitivity for their free time as to the parents that actually drop off the children. So, so I'm taking that into consideration. Uh, with the issue of sound, um, uh, the, the number of children could be reduced, and that's a possibility. Uh, but certainly the, the railing, the fencing, I don't think that's appropriate. There has to be legitimate fencing that walls off the, the, in the visibility, if you will, as well as the sound. Now that may pacify some of the neighbors in the area, it may not. But this is a, a, a happy medium, I'm, I'm suggesting that, that that would be a condition for me. Um, we talked about the business, operating the business as a business. Uh, I don't think the applicant should be as passionate running the business side as well as the education side. Avoid many, 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 many issues down the road. But that's not for me to say, I'm just putting it out there as it were. Um, so all, at the end of the day, I, I, I'm leaning on uh, admitting uh, the applicant, but with restrictions or with conditions. Conditions as in what we haven't even discussed yet. Well, let's let's talk about, I, 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 think, I think the best way to proceed here is probably for us to try to sketch out our conditions and then compose a motion 
and vote on it in, in one fell swoop. So I think we're going to be looking for some head nodding for the next few minutes just so that we can try to twist the dial so that we don't end up with too many friendly amendments and, and confuse everything and everybody. Does that make sense? Head nods? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Um, and we do have the proposed condition submitted by the applicant, which that's, uh, I think, a helpful uh, skeleton, a helpful starting point. Uh, and that's those uh, proposed conditions start on page 17 of the um, PowerPoint submission that we, that we uh, received this evening. Um, I think one lighting, other than the existing lighting above the garage doors and the main entrance to the house, no lighting shall be installed in a manner that would cast any additional lighting into adjacent properties, and any lighting that may be installed for the play area shall be down shielded. Okay. That seems to me to be an appropriate condition. That that does to me too. I, uh, one one thing I, I struggle with on all these conditions, as well as a couple I've jotted down, is uh, I, I not to put too much on the code enforcement officer, but some of this I, I would like there to be a discretion component that um, you know, and maybe one of the conditions is a code enforcement officer review of the facility, but if in the code enforcement officer's discretion, for example, the lighting at the garage is inadequate, I don't necessarily think the applicant would want to or need to come back um, to anybody to discuss that. So I think we, we might want to build some flexibility in there, whether we do that in each individual one or as sort of a generic catch all. Uh, I, I, I think that's something we should consider. I, I think that would, and Ben, correct me if I'm wrong, but let's assume that we adopted condition one, and let's assume that somebody raised an issue with the lighting, and you went and determined that you felt that the lighting was inappropriate given this condition, it was too extensive, then you'd have the opportunity to, in, uh, to, to issue some kind of enfo uh, enforcement letter. And then the, uh, then, uh, the, the applicant um, Ms. Casey, right? I'm trying to lose my mind here. But that's my bedtime. <laughs> Ms. Casey would have the opportunity to bring that back to us if she felt as though that notice were inappropriate. Yes. Okay. Or she could simply correct the issue. Correct. Okay. Okay. So yes, one I think is good. Okay. And even with our short winters, I'm not sure it ever gets dark between 8.30 a.m. and 3 p.m. With their abbreviated hours, I think the lighting schedule in the ordinance is geared more towards daycares that are open until 5 or 6 o'clock at night when it's dark in the winter. But it still wouldn't hurt to have it as a condition. Are, are we limiting the hours from 8.30 to 3? Is that Was that in the stipulations? I consider people's applications okay. to be self-limiting. If they're, you know, it says gen generally the same as Pond Cove, 8.30 to 3. Okay. I mean, if it was, if I got a call that it was 3.15, I wouldn't have much of a concern. But okay. if I started getting calls that it was 4.30, 5 o'clock, I would say you're not consistent with your zoning board application. Okay. I'm not so sure that the play area, uh, that number two, uh, the second proposed stipulation on page 17, play area is uh, necessary as that seems to mirror the language that's in the ordinance with the exception of the reference to the deck. I, I do need the zoning board to define what is necessary for the outdoor play area. Okay. Uh, is there a it's, provision in the code dealing with fencing? Not the start, not chapter no, 19. No, no the, the zoning ordinance doesn't really speak to fencing. Uh, but, you know, we, we have this question of an outdoor play area. They talk about using the deck as an outdoor play area. But now, based on the testimony, I understand, you know, the yard is also an outdoor play area. So if if the yard is also being used as an outdoor play area, should should any outdoor play area be fenced in? Yeah. And that's kind of a zoning interpretation question. The zoning isn't clear on it. It It'll, says you're required to have at least 450 square feet fenced in, 
but does that mean that any outdoor play area needs to be fenced in or just some? The provision talks about a minimum requirement. Yeah. Um, I'm suggesting that there's a pacification of the neighbors, the budding neighbors that have raised noise issues as well as uh, the concept of attractive nuisance comes to mind when they're going to slide down the hill and potentially um, hit a rock wall or what have you. Um, how do we address the, you know, do you do a perimeter fence and what do you make the fence out of and how high is it? You know, these are all cost issues, but these are also condition issues. I mean, we could set, state as a as an example. I'm not saying this would be the condition, but that at a minimum, the rear property line and the property line to the side of the one abutter, because there's not an abutter on the other side, be fenced with a solid material. And how high? Well, that's. I mean, it can't be higher than what? Like, was it six feet? If it's a solid oh. fence, isn't there? Not necessarily, but six feet is a good rule of thumb. Yeah. I think the first question the zoning board should answer is, does any outdoor play area need to be fenced in? Isn't, yeah. Isn't that, doesn't that logically make sense that it, isn't that, it's, well, I, I would need to go back and read this for my time, but it seems to be, I'm sorry, yeah, within the contemplation of fencing is that if you're using it as a play area, it's supposed to be fenced, otherwise what's the, why have any fencing at all? If you could put the fence here and go out and play in the open area, it, to my intuition, without parsing out the language, is that if, it, if you're going to use it as a play area, it ought to be fenced. I would be comfortable with, with a condition being that any, any play area must be fenced in with a solid fence material uh, of six feet in height. Yeah. That'll limit noise. And that could mean an entire perimeter fence, and that would be the right. play area for that definition. Right. So just to play this out, that means a neighbor in the back, viewing from their backyard, sees a child outside of that perimeter fence, right? And that's a violation of the condition. Not necessarily. I mean, a child can be... It wouldn't necessarily be a play area if a child is outside of the fence. Did you have a question for the applicant? <laughs> I think there is something that we can do voluntarily that makes this whole discussion easier. Um, there's, there's a wooded space between the deck and the property on the other street to the rear. There is no visual buffer or screen to the side property on Channel Road. What I think makes sense to me, and I just briefly talked with Nancy and Jeff, is if you put a fence on the perimeter of the property line, the inside your property line, between the butter on Channel Road and you, does that make sense to you? And he said, side yard only. Rear yard is wooded, so there's, there's sound buffering from vegetation, is fully affected? I'm not sure. But, it's going to be really expensive to put a fence down one side property and then across the rear property line. But I do think that side is going to be addressed. The other thing I don't want to have happen is preventing area from using the deck as, as a play area, but I don't read the ordinance as precluded. All it says on page 247, as a number of cases directed me to earlier, is a fence up or a play area shall be provided with a minimum of 75 square feet. What the board is making sense of in terms of the testimony is there is this question of screening between the property of Jeff and Mary and St. So it makes sense to have a fence in that point. There is no vegetative screening on that point. There is to the Okay. Well, with the condition as currently stated any outdoor player must be fenced with a solid fence at least six feet in height I mean you you have the latitude to make that you know 450 feet or 10,000 feet so you don't have you're, the zoning board is enforcing you to spend tons of money on fencing but it is saying zoning board would be saying that they expect any outdoor play area to be fenced in 
So the outdoor play, it's self-contained. Yes, I agree with that. Okay. So any outdoor play area shall be uh, fenced in um, with solid type fencing of six feet in height. Maybe not say exactly six feet, but it may be at, at least six feet, so. At least six feet? At, le at least six feet, yeah. but no more than seven. Yeah. I, you don't want a 20-foot yeah. fence. Yeah. <laughs> right, no, no, and I think I think seven is the is the spite fence. You yeah, yeah, yeah. The, above seven, you start getting into that definition under state law. second condition here is that the, the purpose that we're talking about of fencing the fencing condition is to create an, an outdoor play area that's that may be the outdoor deck if they put a perimeter fence around it or maybe additional outside space uh, everyone agree correct I don't, I don't think we're dictating exactly where it has to be but for the purposes of our discussion that the the outdoor deck does not as currently in situ, constitute outdoor play area that would satisfy this section of the ordinance. Correct. Because of the lack of fence, not because it's deck, it is outdoors. Okay. But it's just not fenced. Can we turn to uh, page 18, sub three? Are we comfortable with where we're at at this point? No. Is that live? Okay. Exterior of the house. No other improvements are required to the exterior of the house for Operation Home Take Care. Or educa educational school units serve not more than six pupils at one time. I'm, I'm not sure what educational school unit is here. Yeah, I'm, I mean, but, but yeah, the, yeah, I'm not sure what the purpose of. Of this it's not a condition this is kind of a statement that yeah i'm not so, i'm not so sure important. that it's needed but I mean, if they want to do more improvements then come and apply for it uh, yeah i mean it's so yeah. in paragraph three on page 18 yes right the way i read it that there are at least two possibly three conditions in that one sentence the first is that no other improvements are required Okay, so that we're not saying that that's not a condition. So cut that section. So I'm not sure what the middle operation of the home day to serve that, that phrase. Not sure what that means. But the last part is no more than six. So are we happy with the six? No more than six students. I, I think I, I certainly am. That's the application, and I guess we may as well, I know I know Ben considers the application to be self-limiting. We, we may as well state it as a condition, right? I, th I think so. I agree. Yes. I yeah, agree. and that's the most of your jurisdiction. Oh, that's right. It's yep. planning board. Over yep. six students goes to planning board. Okay. So we we don't even need that. No. Nope. No. Okay. Now I raised well, the number. Of, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Other than in the, I mean, Mr. Germain had the Saint Germain had the concern that this could somehow um, verge into something with eight or twelve. I mean. Even six would be, there's no reason to say six because by definition, a home care can only have six. Does it hurt to put in that condition or is that just? It's already there, it's already in the ordinance. So they have, it would have, they'd have to go back to planning board with an additional okay. site plan review application. Okay. We could, the condition that I was thinking of was putting out there earlier is that we cut it back from six to another number. Okay. And that would be a condition. I see. So okay. if it's six, then the code applies. If it's seven or more, then a different section applies. Right. Um, and, and if there's if the fence is adequate, I think the number of six or less is fine as as it is in the application. Yep. Yep. 
I, I would agree. So then we're on to proposed condition four on page 18, which reads noise. Operation of the school is likely to generate only minimal noise, including the voices of a very few four to five year old pupils. The operator will limit noisy outdoor activities to the period between 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. The operator will take tangible actions to reduce the noise coming from the school, document those actions, date, time, and action, in parens, and report monthly to the Cape Elizabeth Code Enforcement Officer. I so, like, oh, yeah. couple couple things in here. Uh, I think we could strike that first sentence, but um, I, I don't see in the application, but I see referenced a number of times the four to five year old. So, I mean, I would think one of the conditions, uh, not necessarily four to five, but I, I would like to add a condition that, you know, no kids under two, um, just to ensure that it's not an, an infant daycare. Uh, I don't know how the other members of the board perhaps feel about that or the applicant for that matter. And that's probably not done here, but it, it, it came up for the first time in this one. Pupil, uh, pu students must be, pupils must be from between the ages of three and five. Yeah, or maybe three and six, I don't know. Yeah. I, mean, I don't account for birthdays in different places. So three and six, yeah. 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 Sorry. Three, three, to six. three to six. I want to just, there's a defined term here on page 15. And they're talking about what a child is. And a child is up to the age of 16. Um, so is there a particular reasoning that you have for it's just three to six and you're not suggesting that someone seven or eight years old is not going to be appropriate here? I can't rule that out, that, that possibility. Uh, I mean, I think. Setting it out there for you. I, I think it just goes back to if this is a, it's a school, but it's licensed as a home daycare. And to me, eight, nine, 15 is not home daycare age. That's a, that's a different beast altogether. Not, we're not, not homeschool or a variant of that. Nothing. Correct. And, and not children that may have uh, learning disabilities. It could be between three and six and have learning disabilities, I, but I, I think it's a it is a home daycare setting for specific age of kids. That's okay. to me reading you know and yes I am reading a little bit into the ordinance. That seems to be policy setting where um, where the comprehensive plan and the zoning okay. ordinance are going. And we might feel differently about the noise issue if we knew that the school was being populated by. 12 to 16. So it seems relevant. Correct. I mean, it seems relevant to yeah. why we might approve it in the first place. I don't love the idea of yeah, do we chasing want to, a monthly noise report. <laughs> do we want to yeah. burden <laughs> Ben with that? <laughs> Daily? Weekly? I don't think we need to. <laughs> no. Because those reports come in fine for, you know, maybe a year or so, and then inevitably whenever people are required to report to me, you know, things things fall off and I just chase it forever. Yeah. So, so really number four is the operator will limit noisy outdoor activities to the period between 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. And we're already Monday through Friday, right? You're proposing that as a condition? Well, I believe the application is on, well, it's Pond Cove schedule. So, sorry. Well, um, I want to understand Change your thinking as to this. You're suggesting that there should be an affirmative pressure on the applicant to limit outdoor, no, outdoor noise. Uh, frankly, I think it's the, the odds are limited to just these two hours in any given day, but that's what the applicant has proposed. Uh, This would, this would relate, relate to, the, to the use, to this particular use, yeah, I, which is the, which would be the, the child care operation. Yes. Well, the, the, the condition proposed 
It says they'll limit noisy outdoor activities to between 10 and 12. So it doesn't mean there can't, there can't be any other. Yeah. What's noisy? Right. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. The use of the word noisy in this context kind of, I'm not sure what that means. I mean, it, 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 on one hand, it almost seems like a license to make noisy outdoor activities. I mean, <laughs> I, I, as opposed to the less noisy, I don't, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't use that terminology. That um, I mean, I think in, in in every instance they should be the attempt should be to not have noisy activities. I mean, we understand that certain activities are going to be noisy, but we, I don't think we really want to kind of sanction noisy as something that's acceptable. I mean, we understand it's going to happen, but it's not. It doesn't seem like that's. Well, anything goes during this two-hour period. I'm overstating it a little bit, but um, in other words, you would want to say something to the effect that the operator will limit outdoor activities likely to cause the most noise to the period between. Um, well, we could even say the operator will limit pupil outdoor activities to the period between 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. Take out the word noisy. Well, What about outdoor play? I don't, I, I, I don't, we don't just play. What we do is we have relay races and very structured play. And I think what my neighbors are upset about is my voice because I, I didn't know this was bothering them, but I, I coach them on. I, you know, I get excited and I, I, I'm the one who's causing the noise, not the children. <laughs> So I don't have to do what I do. And I think all of the, the problem, most of the problems that they're um, experiencing will go away. If I don't do all the, you know. So can, is it okay from your perspective if just the word noisy is taken out of that sentence? Say the operator will limit outdoor activities? To the period. I've heard a couple times that it makes sense, but the one caution I give is that it's got to be associated with the, I heard the comment associated with the daycare. So the operator will want to help your activities associated with, it's, it's the educational program content, though. That's why I use the word education. You see what I mean? Associated with the home daycare? Yes. Do we need to, I don't know if we need to put in there that as this applies to this piece of property, I mean, she's welcome to take him to the beach. But I think that, that's, uh, that's implicit, I think. Is it, or are we limiting the activities? No. Okay. We can only limit the activities for this property for, right. this, for this particular use. And I'm not sure we have to say explicitly that, you know, home daycare, we're, I mean, obviously we're not limiting, this proceeding isn't limiting the personal use of your house if you want to have a barbecue on, on a Saturday. I, I, don't, I don't think we have to state that. In no. these. You can mow your lawn at 7 a.m., always frowned upon. <laughs> okay. So, so th this is what I've got. Let's let's take a quick pause here, and I'll, I'll read read what I have so far. And I've I've kind of cut and pasted a little bit here, but I, I have, uh, and this would be our condition number one, would be as is per the proposal 
in the in the uh, PowerPoint, the lighting, and that relates to the lighting. So that's as is, and I don't, I don't think we modified that. I think we kept that as is. For number two, any outdoor play area will be completely enclosed by fencing, not less not less than six feet in height, and we should say solid fencing, not less than six feet in height, but not exceeding seven feet. Our condition number three, pupils, pupils must be between the ages of three and six. Condition number four, puts on back, us back on track with the proposed conditions on page 18, where the uh, operator will limit the outdoor, uh, outdoor, educational acti outdoor educational activities to the time period between 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. Uh, so then we're on to proposed condition five. Everybody, more or less comfortable with what I've said so far? I mean, uh, there is a sentence about the operator, I, I understand we want to get rid of the, the accounting requirement, but just the operator will take it, tangible actions to reduce the noise coming from the school. I mean, is that, can we leave that in? As, just as in, imposing additional commitment on the applicant to make sure that they're reducing, making an effort to reduce the noise. I, I, I'm, I myself am concerned with that because I don't know what tangible actions mean, particularly when we're, we've already imposed a condition limiting the outdoor activities and when we're requiring fencing. And I don't want too much of, to put too much of an onus on Ben when when folks come to him, him and say, "Hey, one of the one of the conditions is the operator will take f further tangible actions." And what are those actions? And, and, and says, I don't know, okay, yeah, we better come up with some tangible actions. And that, that, I'm concerned that becomes a slippery yeah. slope. Yeah. Um, I understand that. Yeah. I, I'm not, and I'm not going to belabor the point. I might have used different language myself. Just we'll take, we'll make reasonable efforts to reduce the noise coming from the school, just as a general statement of, of, of policy. But. To an uh, operator will take uh, reasonable actions to limit the noise coming from the school. Noise. Well, I think I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with Two concepts that was addressed by uh, Attorney Hamilton. Mm -hmm. um, so while the, the affirmative action is, is on the operator here, it will limit. Um, why, why do you believe it's this section that will take tangible action? Why is this for you want more qualifying? On the noise? Yes. Uh, well, I was just making, you know, I was making the suggestion that it would be a condition that they try to keep noise to a minimum, in fact. So here's how I just revised our condition four. Uh, and here's the entirety, I should say, of our proposed condition four right now. The operator shall limit uh, outdoor educational activities to the time period between 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. The, op uh, the operator will will take will will make reasonable efforts to limit noise. A small clarification. Sure. Can you change the word operator to uh, Miss Casey? Because it runs with the land, I think we probably should define it more generally. Uh, I'm thinking that that's going to be a condition that I'm going to struggle with. That it runs with the land? No, that this is a conditional use. It may run with the land, oh, okay. provided that as long as Mrs. Casey, Miss Casey is there as, as the teacher. Now, if she's not licensed, then the then what? It reverts back to a residence. Well, I mean, one, one of our, I think, proposed conditions is it's subject to state licensure. Oh, sure. I, 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 I accept that point. Yeah. But let's assume that um, the, prop, 
property uh, is going to be sold in 10 years' time, and this couple wishes to do something else, does that mean that this property is forevermore a, a, a school? It, uh, I'm, that I, conditional use is approved, no, yes. I, then I, I struggle with that. It's, you know, the abutters say that they don't want a school there. Well, it expires after, I think it expires after a year of non-use. Did I read that somewhere? Correct. It, yeah, it exp if they don't, if, if buyers don't use that conditional use, yeah. yes, it expires after a year. But if they, it, it certainly could be somebody who buys it with the intention of continuing so that, to operate a, a daycare. Sure, this is more um, creep, as it were, for the use of the property. Well, so, it would have to be used in the same manner, with the same conditions. Yeah, yeah. and I think that here we have such extenuating circumstances with the applicant that would justify having this type of use. I do not, I don't know if I'll have, that the future applicant would have that same um, basis to request a conditional use for this property. I, I think once the conditional use is approved, it's there. And, and unless, if, if I were to come in and buy the property from, from Ms. Casey, then I would have the opportunity, so long as I could get the appropriate licensure from the state, to run a limited um, daycare, home daycare, on those same ter terms and conditions, and therefore I would then be the operator. I, I'd rather have, if the applicant wishes to do something else with their life, that's fine. But someone else would have to come by for this bird and apply. I don't think it should just pass automatically with the, with the transfer of the, of the title. Yeah, can we limit that? Well, then it sounds like you're fundamentally opposed to approving the the conditional use, because I think that's the way the ordinance reads. I see the applicant coming before us asking for a particular use of this property. It's 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 in the middle, in the middle area, all right. Okay. Uh, I'm looking at a, a section that talks about conditions. Now, ordinarily, fine if it wants to change to a, a school. Okay, that's fine. But th we're talking about a fairly particular location of this property. You know, we have a number of people that have testified this evening that are really annoyed that this is going forward here. And these, you know, you know, how do you pacify their concerns? I, I mean, I, I, look, I, I do believe the ordinance is written in a way that, that does give us the ability to limit the condition to this particular user, even though broadly speaking, the conditional use permit goes with the land. I worry that that's a little bit of an overreach on our part to do that. I mean, I, it technically says we can impose, I think, any any conditions we believe justified. So, I mean, uh, it's very, very broad in that respect. I'm not sure we want to test how broad that is by imposing something that is clearly contrary to what a conditional use permit is. I'm willing to go there, by the way. I have no problem doing so, that. <laughs> so, on the, on the one hand, the reason I, I look at it slightly, I'm raising this, is that there's a licensing aspect to using this property. Mm -hmm. All right, you can't do certain things without the license. And so if you don't have the license, you can't do the thing. So the condition precedent is the license. The, the person doesn't have the license, they can't use the use. They can't sell it, they can't, you know, but when that's how I see the, the process. Yeah, and if they don't use it for a year, they can't get licensed for a year, well, it's that's, done. That's in the code provision. I'm talking about something similar where if you choose not to, to have it as a school, it just lapses automatically, right? But what happens if you, you know, tomorrow, hypothetically, um, they, they sell it? And so you have a new person coming in running the school. That is explicit. This is, an, well, I, I say, this I, is yeah. a true exception to the process here. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm, hence I'm raising it as a condition, in my view, as a condition that could just limit it to this now. We, we can't do that. Let's look at section section 19-5-5 on page 66, sub F. Duration, duration of a conditional use approval. It's a continuing grant of permission for as long as the property is used for such purposes. It will expire if the owner physically alters the property and or structure so it can no longer be used for the, for the conditional use or ceases to use the property for the approved conditional use for one year or fails to initiate the operation or conduct the conditional use within one year of the date of the board's vote to grant said approval. So I, I, I am of the opinion that we cannot impose a condition that overrides a, the plain, clear language of the ordinance. 
to, to, to try to bring some focus and closure to this issue. I, I have listened, been listening carefully to Mr. Stevens' concern that for this long day care, it's going to have to be state licensed. So I think this could thread the needle between what you just said, which I agree with, uh, Mr. Chairman, and what Mr. Cage is saying. What if we said something like this? Could, could you yeah, it, okay. if you could you yeah, sure. send the mic. Thank you. And, I, and I'm, I'm addressing the noise condition specifically. The, the, the first clause stays in. The, the operator will limit um, uh, outdoor education, educational activities to the period between uh, 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. Building on Mr. Barbieri's suggestion and Mr. Caton's uh, request for clarification, what if you added the words in front of the operator, any state licensed home daycare operator of the property will make reasonable efforts to limit noise. Or we could just add a separate condition saying that. Yes, you could do that too. That, that any operator needs to be licensed. That any operator needs to be licensed by applicable state and local authorities, state uh, by applicable state authorities, I think is what we'd say, because here in Maine, that's who yeah. licenses. And, and I think we would, I mean, I, I think we would add that anyway, that sure. that would be necessary. I'm not sure that addresses uh, Matt's point, though, that he wants it to be for this specific potential licensee. I, I just don't think we can do it. I mean, look, it, the section E above, uh, section F there, it does give very broad authority, but I, I tend to agree it's sort of a lawsuit waiting to happen if we were to try to directly go against that, and I don't think there's really any way the applicant could even, I don't think they could stipulate to that because it's written in there fairly clearly. I'd like to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just don't think we can. Sir, sir, I'm, I'm sorry, if, there, if there's going to be further comments, it's going to be at the mic. You know, and I, I just ask you to hold off for now. Yeah, I mean, uh, 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 reading back to 66, I mean, if the improvements that are made as a result of conditions aren't there, then that conditional use permit goes away. Physically alters the property or structure so it can no longer be used for the conditional use. One of those things would be you know, if there, if that fenced in area was removed, it would no longer meet that conditional use. Correct. If she ceased operating for a year before selling it, it would expire. You're right. Or the new property owner moves in and says, no, nah, I don't want to, I don't want to do it this. I just want a house. What's the final, dis what's the proposed final disposition on my suggestion? The way I read section E on page 66 is that it precedes uh, subparagraph F, and it talks about these condition, conditions may include comma, but not limited to such requirements such as, and then there's eight, one through six. And then we go, when we go down to F1, and then the first sentence, it's a qualifying phrase, provided all conditions and standards of approval are met. Now, I'm looking at E when I read that phrase. Now, it, my concern here is that these applicants should be entitled, if they meet the conditions, to operate a, a home daycare set, uh, for school of up to six students between the ages of three and six. All right. I'm not comfortable with them selling the property in that school continues. I mean, that, that, the, then the next issue is, well, what about the people that are going to be licensed? Uh, who knows? But the point being is that this is, I, I find that this is a one-off. Now, if you, if you guys don't believe that that, that is how it, how it reads together, that's fine. I'm, I'm a minority view on this. I, I mean, I can read into that. I, I, I have a tough time selling it to myself. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the whole concept of the conditional use approval is it's, it's not constrained by a time period. You know, we couldn't say, hey, you need to come back in in three years and we reevaluate it. That's, I mean, technically, I guess that's a condition we could try to add, but I don't think that works. I don't think that passes muster. No. So, it's inconsistent. Can I offer just one last observation? 
I think, I think what's important is what Mr. Caton is saying about the state license. That permit, that license, is specific to the operator. The land use permit does run with the land, and that's what those sections on page 66 say. So if you add in a condition that the